weekend science fans we are here this is this week in science the can, podcast i'm what? so sorry can you tap on your mic oh oh that's the right mic. yeah okay you just sound a little it's delayed but it's than very last tinny week. yeah mm -hmm. no and anyway Ooh. Sorry, everyone. Your seat. You're peeking behind the curtain. Yeah, already. technical. Uh, if, I, if I just talk right was... into it, did it change all of a sudden? I mean, I it's, did. It's it's all high end, low end. Yeah, it's very strange. It definitely wasn't I like that last week. Before. This is the same microphone. I haven't changed anything. Uh, I got the right thing. Pretty, uh, Am Could I loud enough the though? It's the yeah. room, probably. Yeah. The room might have a slight high-end echo. I don't know if that's a thing that rooms can do. Maybe if I put it right. I don't know. We'll see if we can get this working. Is it awful? Yeah. No. 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 It's not awful. No. It's just not up to the normal, beautiful, <laughs> kiki timbre. I love the normal, usual, but things are not quite there yet. Shay Kiki. So that makes sense. Uh, it usually takes more than a week to move an entire house and get settled. So, yes, yes, that the tracks. movement is still afoot. Cleaning is occurring in the other house. There's uh, unpacking. I try to do a couple boxes a day, it's good. Two? Sounds... That's ambitious. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, all right, all right, all right. All right. We're do a science show. What are we doing? We're yeah. going to do a science show. That because uh, really what we're here for is the science. This is This Week in Science. We're a podcast and this is our live broadcast. I'm going to continue to get this microphone like right into my face mm -hmm. throughout the hour. Um, but if nothing else, this will not end up in the podcast because what's going on is you're watching us live. You might even you're be watching us time shifted and at some other all point. the outtakes. We this do all, all of outtakes. the outtakes on this this yeah, version. but the, and then the but real the reels, show comes later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Stuff gets cut out. The podcast podcast makes gets made. This is I don't know. You're watching all the bacon right now. All the bacon. <laughs> all the sausage. The sausage. <laughs> yeah. Sausage, bacon, <laughs> potato, potato. Okay, it's already just going to be a great show. Yeah. We are so glad you're here with us this hour for another tight 90 of science discussion. We have so many stories ahead, and uh, we're about to get started. But if you haven't yet, hit that subscribe button, click the like button, make sure you sign up for notifications and ding-dong bells because ding you don't want to <laughs> miss those when we go live every Wednesday. Oh, this is PM great. Pacific time. <laughs> Woot woot! Let's make this show happen. We are we are getting ready to start this show in three, two. This is Twist. This week in science, episode number eight hundred eighty-seven, recorded on Wednesday, August tenth, twenty twenty-two. Vlogs, dogs. Or science. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on the show we are going to fill your head with meat, heat, and sleep. But first, disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. When looking around at the world today, all the global warming, global wars, global poxes, it's important to remember it's going to be okay. Not everything is going to be okay, of course, but a lot of things, most definitely. Well, okay, are not going to be okay. People are getting hurt out there, but some things, things you might not have even thought about as important before realizing, hey, that's not broken yet. That thing is going to be okay. While waiting for the next terrible thing to happen, whatever the next terrible thing uh, might be, re remember the old saying. doesn't matter which old saying. I don't even know any myself. Just pick one. It's good. It's fine. It'll do. Get you through. Remember when we used to joke? about monkeypox on the show oh yeah, because it was funny sounding obscure improbable a thing that could never really have a global impact until <laughs> now and so now we're we're out of terrible guesses that was the last one what happens next we we is beyond compare in fact 
Never mind that it's going to be okay and the old sayings, that sort of thinking never works itself out the way you want it to anyway. Instead, consider what it is you can get involved with in solutions. Life goes by faster than you think it will. Now is the moment in which you can do things. So go do them. Make an impact. Some solutions might require science. So go be a scientist. Others might require legal action. So go be a lawyer. Some solutions may require you to work for a noble nonprofit cause. So pick one. And if the noble cause that you fall in love with isn't out there, start it. You will be ready for the next thing the world throws at us. Because thank goodness for you. And This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know. And a good science to you too, Justin Blair and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back again, as we are every week, to talk about science news. We do love it so much. And I would also like to wish everyone a happy day of lazily spoiling your dogs while vlogging. Huh? What? Yeah, well, if you look on what national day it is today, apparently on the list, well, there are many actual, today is a day of many things, but today was the day of, national day of being lazy, vlogging, and dog spoiling. Well, so, you know, my, that, my favorite yeah, all dog. that stuff I just said about doing something, it seems like a... <laughs> Nope, not today. Not, not today. today. <laughs> my my favorite holiday was just a couple days ago. I hope everyone celebrated National Sneak a Zucchini onto your neighbor's porch day. And did you? I don't none of my neighbors have porches. <laughs> <laughs> so also I would not be caught dead buying a zucchini fleck. But well, anyway, you're supposed to buy what? the zucchini. You're supposed to grow the zucchini. Have I know, I don't too many don't zucchini why and then buy, have Why would you buy a zucchini? I don't understand. <laughs> because people give them to you, so you don't need to buy them. Yeah. No, no and none appeared on my on my front front stoop. I was very disappointed. Oh. Well, you don't you didn't want one anyway. No, I would like... I would re-gift it. You see, I would pass it along. <laughs> That's is the there a national, national is, is the day zucchini after day. National Sneak a Zucchini Day? Is it National Regift a Zucchini Day? National that... Sneak a Zucchini into your neighbor's mailbox day? <laughs> Sometimes I feel like the adults are talking in euphemisms. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like, don't get it. I don't know. Let's talk about science. So yeah. what do I have tonight? I have stories about let's see leak leak not leaking linking uh -oh. your gut to your heart restoring mm. hearing uh impacts that foods have and a few aging stories one specifically for you blair justin what do you have i've got rewilding the west the new home on the range why you should never catch a raindrop on your tongue and uh, the little Arctic, Antarctic uh, ice update came came in. Uh, nice. Uh, you could probably imagine what that one is. That there's lots of it. No. Uh, okay. I don't think uh, so. Blair, what is in the animal corner? Oh, I have a nice, light, fun animal corner today, filled with cancer-sniffing locusts, uh, sleepy spiders, and rat sperm. So uh, it's gonna be real fun. <laughs> all over the place that's mm -hmm. gonna be great well as we dive into our science show tonight i would love to remind everyone that if you're not yet subscribed you can find us this week in science on all podcast platforms well pretty much all of them just look for this week in science you can also find us broadcasting live weekly on youtube facebook and twitch 
we are, uh, let's see, that's that's Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Pacific time. And if you look for us on Twitch, Instagram, and Twitter, we are Twist Science. That's the, how you find us. But if all this is complicated, I mean, I can't even remember all of it. Go to twist.org. It's our website. It's where you find all sorts of information about the show. Now that that's done, everyone click that subscribe, that like, and let's move on to the science. Okay. Why is eating red meat bad for your heart? Why is a raven like a writing desk? Is what you're asking, right? Uh, <laughs> I, something yeah. about the... No, that's not right. I was going to say cholesterol. That's wrong. I don't I know. Love how you have all those sayings and you have no idea what they mean. <laughs> That's, that's from Alice in Wonderland. Please, come on. Uh, Don't insult me with that. All right. So the mechanisms of cardiovascular disease and those specifically that stem from eating red meat and other animal proteins are hotly debated. One of the things, like you said, Blair, cholesterol is high on the list for most people. And we know not that meat consumption doesn't necessarily have all the cholesterol in it that's going to lead to bad cholesterol if you're eating lots of red meat. So there's got to be other stuff going on there. So researchers have been investigating this connection. And this particular paper published in the journal Arteriosclerosis, Thrombosis, and Vascular Biology by researchers at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts University and Cleveland Clinic Learner Research Institute, quantified the risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease associated with meat intake. And they found three pathways that might help explain the risk. They looked at 4,000 US men and women over the age of 65 and as we know, higher meat consumption is linked to higher risk of this kind of cardiovascular disease. 22% higher risk for about every 1.1 servings of red meat per day. So they also determined that this is uh, elevated, about 10% of it is elevated by increased levels of metabolites produced by gut bacteria from nutrients mm. that are found in the meat. And this is the relationship because red meat has certain nutrients that poultry, eggs, and fish do not. And so gut bacteria can explain part of this, uh, this increase in risk. So they found that the gut microbiome generated trimethylamine N oxide, also known as TMAO, and other intermediates, gamma butyrobetane and crono crotonobetane. These are derived from L-carnitine, which is very, very abundant in red meat. So anyway, these particular nutrients L-carnitine gets devoured by the bacteria. The bacteria then create these, in, these other metabolites. The metabolites then affect the cardiovascular system and will also change um, other things. They did find, however, the associated risk of meat intake was affected by blood glucose and insulin, and for proce for processed meats, systematic inflammation, but not by blood pressure or blood cholesterol levels. And so they're saying cholesterol actually isn't as highly in involved in this as they previously thought. And what's happening is that if you already are predisposed to inflammation, that your risk for cardiovascular disease due to the conversion of the nutrients into these compounds by your gut bacteria is higher. If you have a lower inflammation profile, your risk of uh, developing cardiovascular disease is also going to be lower. And the same goes for how your insulin and blood glucose levels are standing. So cholesterol may not be so much of the issue, but it might be more your microbiome. It's always the wow. gut, isn't it? You know, yeah, it's 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 one thing that every almost everything that we've known for the past century about nutrition 
kind of went out the window yeah. once we learned what the gut microbiome was doing and how individually uh, different people are going to be taking up or not utilizing uh, components of what they eat. Now, now heart disease and cholesterol are getting uncoupled by... by uh, yeah, well, not completely uncoupled, but in no, this no, particular case for red meat specifically. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's like whoa. The, now it's now now our knowledge this because this is this is also crazy because this is an, an almost like an entirely new field. Call yeah. it ten years. Call it ten years that we've even had a focus on this, and now we're finding connections uh, throughout human health that we we didn't know existed and had other conclusions or had other you know top suspects on the list, and now uh, it's like. It's like a it's like a constant episode of cold case almost. Oh, it turns out. Remember that uh, that criminal yeah. that we threw put in pr- prison for uh, life uh, for all those terrible crimes wasn't the eh, nothing to do with it. <laughs> criminal after all. <laughs> no. Are we buying the right one this time? Oh gosh, I hope so. Well, but learning more is better because it can allow people to make better choices. You know, if you're more prone to inflammation. Oh, choose yeah. to eat red meat less often, processed meat less often. If you are, you know, completely inflammation free, I don't know. Have at it. Enjoy your red meat. Love that. Also, L-carnitine. who are you and how do you live? Right. <laughs> no stress, no inflammation. You're not alive. You never yeah. have enough good stomach. How dare you? Are you a superhero? Right. Ah, well, I, well, what's I your go superpower? That far. Zero inflammation. Oh, my no. God. Well, that yeah. wouldn't be good. I either. don't experience any of that. That's all like foreign words to me. So I'm I'm right there. Yikes. Yeah. Well, speaking of criminals, there's one that's been caught in the rain. Justin, tell me about it. You don't want to hear this story. I know. I'm I'm I you're love just, singing just and don't. gargling in the rain, but I won't do that anymore. All right, go ahead. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm stalling because my thing is taking too long running. So so okay, this is uh, this is Swedish researchers, University of uh, Stockholm. The scientists there decided to look at PFAS water contamination on the planet uh, Earth, which is it's the planet that we're living on. So that's important. PFAS or per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, aka forever chemicals, because they take a really, really, really long time to break down, and worse, they we've inundated. The air, water, soil, livestock, everything has got this. If you do uh, blood tests of people and check for PFAS chemical, it's in the majority of blood tests. It's it's in everyone's blood. It's everywhere, regardless of where you are, regardless of age. So eventually they will work their way out of the body over about a four-year period, but the problem is they accumulate in the body as you come into contact with the chemical, which is, again, everywhere in our environment. So Mm -hmm. you need to uh, avoid them entirely to not have them, which is hard. So according, this is according to CDC, just a little bit more backstory. PFAS chemical is commonly found in grease-resistant paper, fast food containers and wrappers, microwave popcorn bags, pizza boxes, candy wrappers, stain-resistant coatings used on carpets, upholstery, and other fabrics, water-resistant clothing, cleaning products, personal care products like shampoo and dental floss, and cosmetics, nail polish, eye makeup, paints, varnishes, sealants, and most famously, perhaps, non-stick cookware. The Swedish research team specifically looked for PFAS chemicals in the least likely place possible, sort of as to, to get like a base level of here's what the maybe environment looks like without PFAS chemicals. They looked at rainwater. And while PFAS was detected in rainwater everywhere they looked, including Antarctica and the Tibetan Plateau, Rainwater collected in Antarctica and the Tibetan Plateau only exceeded the U.S. safe drinking water guidelines by 14 times, making it some of the cleanest unsafe water to drink on the planet. So rainwater everywhere on the planet, unsafe to drink. So those people living off the grid collecting rainwater to drink, still bad. (laughs) It's still, it's because it's gone, it's it's everywhere. So this is according to Ian Cousins, lead author of the study, which is published in Environmental Science and Technology. Uh, 
According to some to some studies, exposure can also lead to problems of fertility, developmental delays in children, increased risks of obesity, certain cancers, prostate, kidney, testicular. There was, I think, a thing out there right now, a study talking about liver cancer connection to PFAS. Increases in cholesterol levels, which I guess we don't have to worry about anymore. <laughs> Cousin said that PFAS were now so persistent and ubiquitous that they will never disappear from the planet. This is quoting, we have made the planet inhospitable to human life by irreversibly contaminating it now so that nothing is clean anymore. And to the point that it's not clean enough to be safe. That's a heck of a quote, isn't it? We have crossed the planetary boundary, he says. Yikes. Referring to a central paradigm for evaluating Earth's capacity to absorb the impact of human activity. However, Cousins notes that PFAS levels in people have actually dropped quite significantly in the past 20 years. And ambient levels uh, in, the, in the environment have been the same for the past 20 years. So we, I, think, I think that kind of maybe indicates a, 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 a halting or an attempt to avoid using them. Uh, Certainly, like there was the big Teflon, which was made with these chemicals, which is nonstick pans, which that were heated, which was the chemical industry when they first were coming up with these was like, oh, they're perfectly safe as long as you don't heat them. And then they well, as long as you don't heat them pans. really hot. Heating is then fine. Scratching and pan. overheating is banned. Yeah. Don't use well, your frying pan it, for frying. And you may still have. PFAS type chemicals on your nonstick. They got rid of Teflon specific chemical, but then they altered chemical so that it can not be. Uh, anyway, they banned a chemical and then they created a version of it that's probably just as unsafe to put in your nonstick. But then again, who wants sticky pants? Am I right? Isn't so what I what I'm hearing, Justin, is that if we cut PFAS out of Completely. the supply chain, yeah, in four years we'd be looking a lot better. In four years, uh, well, our that our, you, our bodies would be looking better. What our bodies would would drop in PFAS. However, if it's everywhere in the environment, if it's in the water, if it's in rainwater, which means it's in the circulatory water system, and it's not disappearing from that, then we're gonna keep on getting it and back in us and accumulating. So this is like the trick. Like it's gonna be forever, but. So here's here's the, the silver lining in all this. This is the same research is, set, is quoted here saying, I'm not super concerned about the everyday exposure in mountain or stream water or in the food. We can't escape it. We're just going to have to live with it. So why, mm -hmm. I, guess, I guess the point is, why worry when there's nothing you can do? Yeah, and I saw someone in the chat room said they were going to go buy bottled water. And I just want to throw out there that um, the amount of filtration that happens between water sources in your sink is actually way more filtration than what happens to bottled water. Typically, There's a lot of weird regulations with bottled yeah. water, at least in the United States. I don't know outside yes. of the United States, but inside the United mm -hmm. States, bottled water is not filtered to the same level as your sink. So you're mm -hmm. actually better off with your sink water. Yep. And it does depend on where you live. I mean, there's, there's places that have lead pipes still, apparently. Like, it's like well, the, yes, lead lead pipes depends where you are. Yeah, but if you're in a if you're in an area, most areas yeah. in the U.S. at least have lots of filtration in place, and tap water is meant to be great to drink, or at least that's the PR right. PR around drinking water. Well, yes, I mean, it, it according to the technical regulations, <laughs> higher, yeah, that's how it's supposed to go. But yeah. you know. So I'm just I'm just saying bottled water is also an environmental nightmare. So that is not the solution here. It's not actually going to help you from the PFAS at all. And, and that so, uh, and that so rainwater other... collection barrel, though, that is going to be you know it, it, if it's all you've got, mm -hmm. that's all you got. So, but it's yeah. So it's but it's unsafe to drink, and and a part of this unsafe to drink, there, there's a kind of a little bit of an asterisk there. I have to say which is because uh, we used to not have a regulation for it. So drinking water and everything else didn't, wasn't even looking at this. And then they realized how horrible it was. And then they created 
I think that was like a million parts per whatever lower as the as the back is, is saying here below. This is the new guideline, and it was much stricter than the non-existent one, obviously. But by, I mean, we, they had one, and then they lowered the floor on it considerably. So your your drinking water is most likely safer than apparently than rainwater. Which is crazy. and safer than bottled water because, as uh, Kevin Reardon is saying in in the chat, isn't the bottle that is used to hold the water containing PFAS? So no, no, it that, is, you're, you're, those are, are BPAs. There's a BP- no, there's there's what there is not. <laughs> there what? is also PFAS in the uh, the process uh, that's involved. Oh. In the- the PFAS, plastic containers BPAs. that hold water. So yes, not oh, to mention that man. some reusable items sometimes that have nonstick surfaces also have that. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All of it. Oh, so fun. Forever. The only one I don't think I would give up is the is the lining of candy wrappers because that'd be awful. If every time you opened your candy, it was all like stuck to the side of the packaging. That would be terrible. Is but it? everything else we should get rid of. <laughs> I don't know what candy you're eating. We, we can debate that one later. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Blair. Yes. I got. I'm. Is that? What do I smell? No, no. You're clear. What do I you're smell? clear. I was smelling for cancer, but you don't. Don't. You're good. You're good. Okay. Can we? Can you really tell that? Can no. we really tell that? No, but locusts might. This is a study what? from Michigan State University, and they wanted to test the ability for locusts to smell out cancer. Why? (sighs) Great question. I'm so glad you asked. Uh, Noses are still considered in many ways the most state-of-the-art, reactive, responsive, sensitive gas-sensing equipment we have. And this is related to a conversation we had. Um, I remember Justin was very dubious of the um, COVID-19 sniffing dogs. That's actually considered the gold standard, dog sniffing, for drugs, explosives, health conditions like low blood sugar and COVID, those are considered better than the machinery we have. And so that is why oftentimes when researchers are trying to find new research to sense gases, they turn to animals first. So this is, I I will say this is a um, a pre-publication this has not yet been peer reviewed. It's from BioArchive. Uh, it's preprint. Um, but they wanted to look at locusts because uh, they are one of the model organisms for olfaction. They also use fruit flies a lot, but fruit Ooh. flies are a lot less hardy. And so um, they research have built up researchers have built up a really meaningful understanding of the olfactory sensors in locusts along with their neural circuits. And so from there, they were able to attach electrodes because they're bigger and more rugged. So they were able to al- attach electrodes to locust brains. They recorded the insects' responses to gas samples produced by health cells and cancer cells, and then used those signals to create chemical profiles of different cells. They also were able to find, so this is the difference between cancer and not cancer, but they were also able to find a difference between different lines of cancer different types of cancer based on this sensor. And so they were, they were looking specifically at mouth cancers, which means the, um, the chemical signatures, signatures of these cancers do get aerated. So you could actually have this sensor developed from the same mechanics in a locust brain and have somebody do like a breathalyzer test to see if they have cancer in their system. They do think that this is potentially a, uh, able to be used for cancers outside of the mouth because there are still a lot of cancers that introduce volatile metabolites into the breath. So they think that this could turn into something pretty cool. Um, so the the reason this is so important is that like we find out about cancers often really late in the process. When cancer is caught early on first stage, patients in general have an 80 to 90% chance of survival. But if it's caught in stage four, 10 to 20%. So early detection is key, but without an easy way to detect just like blanket, like, is there cancer on your breath or not? Great. Let's figure out what kind you have and deal with it right away. 
This could potentially have a really easy way. You just go into the doctor for your checkup. You breathe into a little tube and it tells you if you're carrying cancer metabolites in your breath. So it's, you know, I think it is a very cool prospect. Um, they think that it would outpace the speed, sensitivity, and specificity of their current old-fashioned old-fashioned mechanisms that they use. And so, um, no, you will not have to breathe at a locust in the doctor's office. <laughs> Darn it. Dr. Locust. Yeah. No. That's yeah. amazing. Go ahead. You had a question, Justin? No, no. No, I don't have a question. I just, I'm oh, okay. just amazed by that story. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I think it go. makes a lot of sense with the specificity of insects like locusts slash, slash grasshoppers to uh, chemical signals in the environment. Pheromones mm -hmm. from other locusts that they tune into to that call them basically to uh, you know, ravage wheat fields. Come together and eat my pretties. You know, these uh, the chemicals the pheromones, the olfactory signals that insects are tuned into, their their tuning is very specific and very high. They're high resolution compared to humans. But that's the sort of thing that like the speci speci uh, how specificity they are. Yeah. <laughs> is is actually sort of sort of what's uh, amazing about this to me is yeah. that they're picking up something that you know, they're not looking at, it's not like, like, I would almost expect this to be more of the trait of a canine that's okay. Let's pick out the weakest member of the herd and Hey, that one's probably not mm -hmm. going to run as fast. Or maybe there's a reason we should target that uh, wildebeest or that caribou or whatever. What are the, you know, why, why is this resolution possible? And, and, uh, Okay. Yeah. That's that's what's kind of wild about it. They have that, you know, it's an off target hit or whatever, but it's still like incredible. It's still a hit. So, yeah. Yeah. It's I mean, so it appears as though this is this is basically just proof that th their their neural circuits can tell the difference, right? Yeah. So it's it has to be kind of separated from they weren't getting um behavioral changes from locusts based on different stimuli they were they were using electrodes on a locust to right. see if there was a response based on different stimuli, like in a vacuum, essentially. So, so it's basically just, could their, could their neurons and their sensory system handle it? And they can, but that's, that's great. Cause that's all you need to then start to create a non-animal model. A neural network that can mm -hmm. respond in that kind of way through yeah. artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Computers of the future. Be and as Gary uh, Gary points out in the chat room there, and then you can eat them, so you have less red meat at the end right. of the day. Uh, and then, yeah. and then, yeah. Oh, but then other things that we want to do, we want to restore hearing. Also, this does not involve locusts yeah. at all. <laughs> Just gonna put it out there. This story has nothing to do with locusts. Uh, researchers have been trying to figure out how to restore hearing in people who uh, who lose their hearing for genetic reasons and uh, a variety of other reasons for many many years. And a researcher at the Salk Institute in La Jolla. Uh, is working with the University of Sheffield researchers and have published a paper in Molecular Therapy Methods and Clinical Development about their work using gene therapy to basically introduce a dysfunctional gene uh, or fix a dysfunctional gene called EPS8 in the inner ear that then allows hair cells to be long enough to do the vibrating that they need to do to allow the signal transduction of sound waves to occur. So uh, they have shown previously that lack or uh, a, a broken gene of uh, EPS8 ends up with these little hairs in the hair cells, otherwise known as stereocilia, that they're really short. And so with really short hairs, you don't get a lot of vibration. And the way that the hair cells work is that 
in the fluid in the inner, in the ear. The hair cells are embedded. The waves come through and vibrate the tympanum, and then that that jelly material in the ear vibrates, and the hair cells are supposed to vibrate back and forth too. But if they're really short, they don't get vibrated, and if they don't get vibrated, mm -hmm. they don't turn on and they don't transmit a message to the brain to say, hey, we heard something. So uh, they did a whole bunch of studies in mice, but were able to show that they could introduce EPS-8 into the uh, genes of the ear in mice using gene therapy. And it uh, allowed the mice to regain their stereo, the, their long and luscious stereo cilia. And that this, the cells seem to be able to uh, regain their abilities after the therapy. So future research, how can EPS-8 work to restore mm -hmm. hearing during different developmental stages? Is it possible to uh, lengthen the therapeutic window of opportunity? So for kids who have genetic disorders that have led to them having a broken protein, a broken gene, uh, how young can you do gene therapy or how, how old can a, can a child be to allow them to continue to keep their hearing and not to lose it? Nice. Yeah. Let's. Yeah. Let's or or, or use potential it. for drug targeting too, because mm -hmm. If you know that a gene isn't producing a thing, you might there might be ways of tricking the body into working around that, or, or you know, uh, doing what the doing what the genes aren't in real time. Yeah, go body, go, 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 gadget body, hmm. woot woot, hold the ice. Is it time for the story that? Yeah. I don't want to this hear is, about. This is not a story. This is just an update. This is just an update. Just uh, all bad news at the start of the show from Justin today. <laughs> but I've got, but, but stick around because it's all good news at the end. Like legitimately. Okay. Good. This time. Great. I mean it. I promise. Uh, but yeah, July, this isn't it though. We're not there. <laughs> July saw the lowest extent of Antarctic sea ice on record. For a month of July, since satellite records began 44 years ago, the lowest July ice ever. And it's, uh, according to the European Union's satellite monitoring group, 7% below the last 30 year average. So, low ice values <laughs> continue to string, actually, a blow. It wasn't just like, oh, and all of a sudden July was low. It's been the lowest month, a string of lowest below average months every month uh, observed since February. So. Well, this just, is the Anthropocene. In case... This is a yeah. mass extinction. Here well, we it's Antarctica. So if it's less sea ice, does that mean that less ice has fallen off the continent? I'm just trying to look. <laughs> No, it just me, <laughs> right? No. So, no, no, that's a good point, though. Okay, so that's a good point yeah. because there is a differentiation between the sea ice, which is you got this big block of, of ice cap. Yeah. And it's not just that. There's, there is another story that it turns out like a bunch of that's missing, but that's not this story. This story is talking about the ice that forms under the sea and extends right. out and creates these big shelves off yeah. of the sort of off of the, 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 the cap. So how far out that ice has grown uh, or how far back I suppose it's retracted uh, is it's the low ever. Now the thing that I, I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sure about, and this is the problem. Uh, Cause I kept, I was looking at this like, well, July, you know, it's a hotter summer. And so of course it's going to push that sea ice back anyway. It's just didn't, you know, grow out. So, and then and then at some point it dawned on me that that's not how uh, hemispheres work. Right. Yeah. That, in the middle of winter. <laughs> this isn't, this isn't, you know. It's not summer. The, the peak <laughs> summer extent of ice is, yeah. didn't go out as far. This is, this is peak winter ice mm -hmm. that didn't go out as far. That's terribler than, than. Yeah. That means the winter 
in the southern hemisphere is much hotter, which is the part that you really would hope you could catch up for, you know, make catch, uh, make up some ice ground from all mm -hmm. of this hot summer that you had with maybe a cold winter. But no, no, this is the this is the least sea ice in a cold period in the last 30 years. Which isn't that it was it was better before. It's that's when we've been monitoring uh, this data. Yeah, which I also just want I want to mention anyway, when we talk about sea separate. ice that it's it's different when you talk about uh, glacier melt, right? Because sea ice really mm -hmm. the main loss besides just it's it's not helping keep the the ocean the right temperature. It's it's losing its ability to to temper the heat of the water, uh, but it's also habitat. It does not really contribute to sea level rise almost at all. So um, no. the really unlike, unlike the Greenland stories that right. we're hearing about right now. Yes. So sea ice in the water, it's the same amount of water. It's floating on top as ice. It's in the it's basically the same. The displacement, it's the whole, you know, science. Anyway, so uh, the, the ice on land, glaciers, when that melts, it rolls off into the ocean. That was water that was kept off the ocean before. So that contributes yeah. to sea level rise. So I just wanted to throw that out there because I, I saw a couple comments but, in the chat about sea level rise. It is a different And that's issue. a great point. But and so it, the issue you know, is know. that is the sea the sea ice not being there in, in Antarctica is going to change the reflectance and thus mm -hmm. the, albedo the albedo of the earth. So how so how much light gets reflected and so how hot we end up staying mm -hmm. as opposed to reflecting and heat. It, but the green, but the Greenland melting and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's adding to sea sea level. We don't like right. Greenland. Yeah, and I, and just to, just to give a picture of how much it's adding, like how much that ice is above the the sea level, uh, and 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 how how massive that is. There's areas in the northern hemisphere in the Arctic region that when the ice caps melt aren't going to experience sea level rise. And the reason is because all of the weight of that ice is, is compact, has a compacting effect. And when it melts away, the earth is going to exhale a little bit right at the cap. And so there, there's actually going to be land raising in the Arctic region because the massive amount of weight that that is pushing down from these ice caps would be gone. It's, it's Land a home. weird thing to picture how squishy the earth actually is yeah. in, some, in, in some way. That's wild. Yeah. That's our squishy yeah. earth. It's like that's how much earth. ice we're talking it's about. It's our stress it's ball. It's melting away. But we're stressing it. Oh, oh okay. gosh. Oh, boy. Well, let's keep moving a little bit on this, uh, you know, our impact on the planet. Um, not necessarily when it, uh, well, I guess this is all involved in climate change, but also just how we affect the environment generally. Uh, researchers from Oxford have published in the Proceedings of the National Academies of Science, PNAS, uh, their work comparing environmental impacts of meat and meat alternative products like plant-based sausages, burgers, those kinds of things to figure out their environmental impacts. They looked at 57,000 multi-ingredient processed foods. So not just, oh, rice or potatoes, corn. They looked at bread. They looked at products that were found in grocery stores in the UK and Ireland and determined based on all the ingredients and what was reported uh, by the manufacturers of these foods to develop their, their model of how these products are actually impacting the environment and the choices that consumers are making, how those choices are affecting the environment. Mm. Researcher says, uh, Dr. Michael Clark, he was the lead author, said, by estimating the environmental impact of food and drink products in a standardized way, we have taken a significant first step towards providing information that can enable informed decision making. We still need to find 
how best to communicate this information effectively, hey, why don't you talk to our podcast, um, in order to shift behavior towards more sustainable outcomes, but assessing the impact of products as an important first step. So the study, uh, as you would think, uh, ha has found that very often a lot of um, meat-based products are more impactful on the environment. Multi-ingredient vegetable fruit-based products are overall less impactful. They had low input, impact store scores. Um, one of the things that seems to go along with that also is that if they're low impact on the environment, they're also usually have higher impact nutritionally. So the processed yeah. foods good. that people get- That's a get, good ratio. That's a good ratio. You're, oh, the fruits and vegetables and sugar and flour and like soup, salads, breads, and other things like that. They're better for the environment. And they're also better for you. The one thing that did not match this were sugared beverages. Because just if you can imagine soft drinks, they're mm. sugar and it's that's a crop, but it's not really good nutritionally. Might give you a little bit of energy, but then you crash. Um, but the researchers are hoping that by looking at these specific food types, they can help people start shifting their behaviors towards swapping things like beef for beans. You know, maybe people would do that anyway because they don't want the L-carnitine that'll affect their heart anyway. So there are lots of things uh, that go into people's choices, but... Uh, they've used a big data research platform at the University of Oxford called FoodDB. That's food database. Uh, it collects and processes data daily on all food and drink products that are available in 12 online supermarkets, like I said, in the UK and Ireland. So it's a pretty big database of food and it's only as good as the source of the information. And uh, I don't know if we have anything like this with uh, the uh, the FDA or our USDA, because that no, would be really interesting. No, you would never get that in the States. They will never allow <laughs> you to peer behind the curtain and see how your food is made. So there is one thing, and I'm not... Natural I'm not... ingredients. Oh, gosh. It's <laughs> such... uh, American advertising in food is such a con job. It just, it really is. But... And I don't want to sound like I'm trying to advocate uh, for processed foods. However, there is a thing that I've never seen really looked at when we, when we, when I see these sort of, uh, you know, talking about the impact of a food type environmentally, uh, which is food waste. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, because, because if I can put a heavily processed food type thing is in my kitchen cabinet and it, it's still edible a month or two from now, that food waste from that is going to be nothing compared to vegetables, which I'm constantly like, it's almost like yeah, I'm but Justin, in the back that, of my fridge. That it's can is covered in PFAS. It so. is the interior of the can is PFAS. <laughs> yeah. Oh so well, environmental you know, impact. Gonna, there you go. Anyway. Yeah. But there, no, but there is like, there's going to be some ratio. And I, and this is also, this is sort of a, almost off the subject. Peeve, I've gotten a, a rev, rev, revelation that has hit me uh, living in Denmark. When you buy bread here, it is good for up to a week. Tops. And then it goes bad. If you, I've had bread sit on a shelf not even refrigerated in the United States that a month and a half later, perfectly fine. I don't know what bread you're eating, Justin, but that does not happen to my bread. <laughs> no. Really? My bread lasts never... a week if I don't put it in the fridge. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. I'm buying, I'm buying like supermarket plastic wrapped regular, you know, sandwich bread stuff over there. Never had, I like never have bread go bad. Here it happens all like so. Justin, quick. maybe you need well, some glasses, some better glasses. <laughs> yeah. 
Thank you. R and R agrees yeah. with my result. Thank you. All right. Very much. I think the big the big thing here, though, you're talking about food waste, which is organic. And yes, another big study out this week found that lots of methane comes from landfills. Woo, yes. But if we can uh, use a lot of that food waste, compost it and use it for energy production, uh, that is actually a great way to harness that methane so that it actually goes somewhere useful. Uh, We can also take a lot of some of those food scraps. Um, You can, I don't know, take a top off of a off of a vegetable and turn it into a vegetable plant. There are lots of, there are lots of really neat things we can do with food waste. I like using all of my, all of my scraps to make a veggie broth in the winter when I'm going to make soups and stews, you know, so many things you can do, but the problem is on the front end, on the front end, you have all of the, all, the uh, all of the gas, right all of the petroleum products that go into supporting the meat industry. And, uh, and that is always going to be more impactful unless they can start figuring out how to do that. Just using the energy of the sun, it's going to be more impactful than the veggies than you that you buy so yeah, making it's... making the vegetarian choices the healthier choices that way is going to be better for the planet in the long run regardless of that food waste on the on the back end yeah i think the the thing that i i would love to see here that's never going to happen is i would love to see uh, a study like this but even in the uk where this study is happening it would be great if they make policy decisions based on that because as someone mentioned in the chat a bit ago there's you know a lot of subsidies towards corn farmers um, oh, so that we can get all of our States, corn yeah. syrup and all this kind of stuff, right? So if you change your subsidies, so you were subsidizing the, oh, what's this healthy for you and also better for the environment stuff, that would be really beneficial. Farmers would start switching their crops over to these more subsidized things. Those things would be more prevalent. So it's it would be great if if this could, if policy could follow this science. That's all I'm saying. I'm not holding my breath, no. but it would be nice. Oh, policy world. science-based policy? What? Oh, 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 Just add it to the list is all I'm saying. Just oh, add you it. idealist. A little tiny, a little tiny, tiny bit of that this week. Yeah. Little tiny yes. bit of that this week, yes, right? We with really the, uh, That's so with crazy. the chip, I... chips passage, right? The Senate House are passing the... Oh, my our Inflation Reduction Act, which actually is going to impact climate change positively. Mm-hmm. It's good. These things come together in good pass- in good packages. And uh, I'm so excited. It's, you know, not the extreme that we would really, really hope for, but it's something. It's progress. Well, nothing. We're well you're calling so, it extreme. I think it would have to be called the bare minimum of what we should be doing. But yeah, <laughs> extreme. We can call it extreme trying to save the planet. Sure. Ooh. Climate climate experts are celebrating this as a win, as we all should. <gasps> oh my goodness. This is This Week in Science. Thank you for joining us for another episode filled with science news and discussion and so many tidbits of fun. If you enjoy the show, please share it with a friend today. Let's come on back. Justin, I think you had a single COVID story for this hour. You want to jump through that hoop? Uh, Yeah, this is scientists at Scripps uh, Research. Uh, they were uh, identi- they identified antibodies that are effective against a whole host of SARS COVID two variants as well as other SARS viruses. They published this in the Science Translational Medicine Journal. Findings reveal the antibody structures that produce this more comprehensive immune response. Uh, so, unlike the game of whack a mole that we've been playing with these vi- these virants and their spike proteins. And I think we should probably pause there to explain uh, to the audience what whack-a-mole is. Uh, If you're not familiar with whack-a-mole, there's nothing I can actually say that would properly describe it. You're going to have, it's one of those things you're going to have to Google a video if you're not familiar with whack-a-mole because you're going, the analogy is going to come up in life. And it's the analogy is more useful than the the game of whack-a-mole ever was. Be, is, is used more often than there were machines of whack-a-mole. Uh, and there's no, the reason people still refer to whack-a-mole in analogies of things is it's the only thing that describes. 
what it is like building a vaccine to attack a spike protein only to have a new variant pop up with a different spike, meaning the antibody is ineffective against that one. And then you, you create, then you alter it to attack that spike protein and it's mutated to have a different one. Kinda I think, like I think, I think the thing about whack-a-mole though, is that it's random. You can never guess which mole is going to pop up. Right. And, and that is the important part of that analogy is that yeah. it's really hard to anticipate. Yes. Yes. It's just like a game of whack-a-mole. Pete. See, it's the analogy that's needed to describe the, the game itself. That's why you just have to, if you don't know what whack-a-mole is, you just have to look it up. But these new, uh, okay, so these newly discovered antibodies recognize a viral spike region that uh, hasn't really been targeted by the human immune system previously. And it looks to be much more conserved across the many different SARS viruses. So it's something that uh, is perhaps more fundamental to the function of these viruses, therefore less likely to change as new variants pop up as mutations take place. And this is quoting Dr. Reyes and Drabi, PhD investigator, Department of Immunology and Microbiology. If we can design vaccines that elicit the similar broad responses that we've seen in this study, these treatments can enable broader protection against the virus and variants of concern. So this was this would kind of be the, the silver bullet. Problem is that this is a region that hasn't been targeted by human antibodies. And, and it's possible that we don't have the genes to create the antibodies that target this as of yet, because we discovered these genes in macaques. They were actually doing uh, an antibody, antibody study in macaques to, to test out uh, vaccine, give them a couple of dose, sort of simulating what happens in humans. But they were able to tackle these variants because they themselves are producing an immune response that targets this, this conserved region. So studying the effects of vaccine in macaques may not tell us how human immune systems would react because the you know monkeys are genetically different than humans, but that difference uh, could be the key to building a better vaccine as they seem to have a, they seem to have the, the right gene combination to create the right antibody to attack the broad field of the SARS virus. So yeah, I think this kind of research is absolutely necessary. I mean, we need to figure out how to move forward so that, like you said, the whack-a-mole isn't happening. And as Blair pointed out, the randomness we actually can anticipate. So we actually know where those mutations are going to be so that we can, and we can just go broad sweep, whoop, antibody. And I think we talked about it last year, but also a paper came out finally in Nature Communications this week, uh, reiterating and reporting the fact that some 66,000 people a year in Southeast Asia are infected by SARS variety viruses. Yeah. There, and so spillover events are going to happen um, and they're going to happen potentially more and more often with human interaction with animals, with climate change, with all these things. So um, one antibody to rule them all. Yes. Southeast Asia is a, is, a, is a perfect location for viruses to get into and spread amongst the humans because the climate uh, doesn't have a, a hard cold spell that uh, makes things yeah. dormant and it uh, high density of human population. Uh, so it's, you know, that's where, that's where most of the humans are. If you were to just say, okay, just based on the numbers, wh where are the humans on the earth? We're in Southeast Asia. That's where we live. I don't know. Aside from the volcanoes, I really, really think I need to move to Iceland. It's co usually colder there. The, I mean, they've had the viruses, but they have fewer parasites. Everything's a lot nicer there, except for the cold and the rain and the, the, the volcanoes. And I don't know. How far north can you go with climate change making all the north hot, Blair? How far north I can mean, we go? How about off the planet? <laughs> <laughs> Just build a biodome. You're set. That's right. I'll stay there forever. On that note, for biology time, bum, 
bum, bum, bum, bum. It is time for that part of the show that we know and love. It's Blair's Animal Corner. With Blair? She loves our creatures, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. What you got, Blair? Thank you. I can't start without it. Um, <laughs> hey, do spiders sleep? What do you think? Never. Never. Are, That's how they keep falling just, into people's mouths when they're when they're sleeping. They're, they're just alive. Around. And then they die, right? Okay. <laughs> Rough. Uh maybe is actually the answer. <laughs> Um, this is a study uh, where some researchers put cameras on baby jumping spiders at night to see if they slept. The footage showed patterns that looked a lot like standard sleep cycles. The spider's legs twitched and parts of their eyes flickered. This appeared to be a REM sleep-like state. And as we know, REM or rapid eye movement is an active phase of sleep when parts of the brain light up with activity and is closely linked with dreaming. Birds and mammals have been shown to experience REM sleep, but it's really hard to figure out with little creepy crawlies if they're dreaming or not, um, because for one, a lot of them have fixed eyes. So you can't see rapid eye movement if there's no eye movement at all. Oh. For another... Oh. Wait, so they have little so blob spiders brains. have to turn their heads to, to see? No, in fact, uh, jumping spiders in particular have eye movement. They can move their retinas around to change their gaze when they hunt. So they were able to observe rapid eye movement or something that looked kind of like that in these spiders. They also have a see-through layer on their on uh, outer layer that gives a clear window into their body so they could kind of see what was going on internally with them as well. Um, they found they had these jumping spiders in a lab already um, and and found that um, the the spiders at night would hang from threads of silk in their lab containers and just chill for a really long time. This is at University of Constance in Germany. And so from there, the one of the researchers in lab was like, you think that spider's dreaming? Which I guess is exactly what you would do if you're a researcher in a lab, super late at night, surrounded by spiders. I imagine like half the lights off because a lot of the researchers have gone home, right? You're stuck there. You're, you're plugging through some data. You look to your side. You see a baby jumping spider just suspended from the top of their cage. Just really looks like they're snoozing. No, it's time well, to do I've, some I've research. Seen, I see spiders like that, and I think they're they're dead, right? Mm. Right? Don't don't spiders end up just hanging from a piece of web, all curled their arm their arms their legs curled up mm -hmm. inward when they die? Yeah, and I, as we found out from our spider claw a couple weeks ago, they do that because they're hydraulic. So that also means that if they're in rest, they're going to be curled up because of the hydraulics of the legs so if their if their brain is turned off then that is the position that they should be in um the the researchers also said that just observationally it looked a lot like REM sleep in dogs or cats the way that they twitched a little bit when they were in this state and that it happened in regular cycles very similar to sleep patterns in humans so all that to say do we know if they're technically sleeping? I would say it's it all depends on how you define it, but I doubt that they are having the complex rapid eye movement that birds and mammals experience simply because they have this blob brain that is not it is not quite the complex network that we have. So um, it's possible. But I think it's it's likely not as not as complex as what we experience. Would be my personal guess. 
I don't know because also my, part of sleep is like long term memory storage and all this other stuff yeah. that we actually know um, invertebrates can do. So there's an argument to be made the other way, but there needs to be more testing to figure out whether um, whether they're fully out, whether they respond to triggers slowly or not at all while they're asleep, asleep, quote unquote. And I don't, they have to find a way to scan a spider brain for for sleep activity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got a very high resolution scanner to do that one. Um, <clears throat> so we know that even yeast have circadian rhythms. So mm -hmm. there is this idea of the need for sleep that goes across all taxa of mm -hmm. the uh, animal kingdom, right? So sleep, yes, maybe they do sleep. Is it REM sleep that they are right. Really experiencing where they're dreaming, where they're practicing their their neurons. I mean, maybe with the neurons, even though it's just a ganglion, a ganglion, and not a complex brain, perhaps the neurons still need to practice their connections with one another to allow for mm -hmm. better learning. We know that jumping yeah. spiders do have a certain amount of learning and memory and behaviors that last them into the future. So I actually would be on team REM sleep. Hmm, the that's jumping very spider. interesting. Yeah. I, I, I concur with that, Kiki. I think there's uh, the fundamental thing that dreams do, and humans get all bogged down with having this big complicated brain that has all this, well, I think what my dream my meant dreams something. Mean? <laughs> but the function is to, you know, while you're doing that is, yeah, you're locking in memory or you're maybe uh, running through scenarios and strategizing so that the, the if a fly does hit the the web today you've been thinking about it so i think spiders are probably dreaming about flies getting stuck in their web and 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 that sort of in a form of mental practice for the event also also i uh, would predict that flies also dream about getting stuck in webs very different dreams depending yes. on which which brain. One is one is an ex one's a happy dream, one's a nightmare. But uh, yeah, I think. Well, let, let me ask you this, Justin. Do you think that necrobiotic spiders dream of electric flies? Ooh, that's a good one. Yes, of course. <laughs> anyway, all the time. Now we're really starting to delve that's into the happy very couple. very edges of philosophy and consciousness yeah. and that's the that's the name of the novel that inspired the film web runner just so you know so it's anyway i haven't heard of any of it somebody Roman. out there got it anyway um <laughs> next i want to talk about that's rat cool. sperm okay but it's not where you expect it it's inside a mouse wait what uh-huh uh -huh. so researchers have generated rat sperm cells inside sterile mice Oh. Oh. using a technique called blastocyst complementation. The idea is you can use pluripotent stem cells to create a chimera, a rat-mouse chimera. Mm -hmm. I have to find my, the exact language because it's, it's a domino effect that it's wild. So, okay, so normally pluripotent stem cells can be used to make gametes um, in the form of eggs or sperm. It's really hard to do, but it can be done. Most of the time, pluripotent stem cells are often used to create um, rat organs in mice. But the idea of making a rat gamete inside a mouse so taking those two areas of pluripotent stem cell research and putting them together has not been done so they wanted to see if they could do this they injected rats uh sorry they injected rat pluripotent stem cells into mouse embryos to produce a mouse rat chimera an essential gene for sperm production was mutated in the mouse blastocyst so that's step two the rat stem cells developed together with the mouse cells generating a chimeric animal composed of genotypes from the two species. So we have a rat mouse chimera. A consequence of the genetic sterility in inducing mutation was that the testes were an empty niche. They didn't, they were sterile. They didn't create mouse sperm. 
Then rat cells could colonize the testes, generating rat sperm in mouse rat chimeras. What? So it's basically, it's, it's the combination of making these chimeras and manipulating very specific genes yeah. to create basically like a vacuum <sighs> inside the, not physically, but like like a yeah. like a power vacuum almost right like like i i have testes with with no sperm inside uh oh so like what can I, what do i got in here oh oh rat sperm so like rat sperm can fill that space basically okay so so what are the what are the implications for like uh endangered animals and respeciation that's exactly stuff? it yes so um before we get there though this oh. proved that this could happen but the sperm cells were able to fertilize egg cells, but yeah. they didn't develop normally. They did not give rise to living offspring. Mm. So ah, okay. this per this piece worked, but it yeah. did not work to fruition yet. And very importantly, somebody says at the very end of this release, one still needs to showcase the production of female reproductive cells, i.e. eggs, in female sterile mice, especially if we envision utilizing this technology for species conservation efforts. So they were able to make sperm. But without an egg, you're... That's the point. You're up an oviduct without a paddle. <laughs> oh As anyway, the old saying goes. Yes. So they definitely... This, that needs to be figured out. Before this means anything. However, the idea here is that that means a sterile animal could be a host for the generation of germ cells from other animal species, which means they could be utilized to produce endangered animal species gametes inside prevalent animals, like a super endangered rodent inside a mouse. and Or a um, woolly mammoth inside an elephant. Right. But what rhinoceros. they're really excited about, as researchers often are, is human medicine. So yeah. they might be able to use this to produce rat transgenic models for biomedical research. So they can use the 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 same methods to create the the perfect specimen for medical research this way. <laughs> yeah. That the perfect specimen that just has this <laughs> yeah so so first they have to there. they have to make an well so i guess first they're going to try to see if they can get these sperm to work with eggs and right. then they're going to try to get a to find a way to make eggs which like that's a, sorry a different that's story insanely more difficult in a lot yeah. of ways like male mammals are churning out sperm constantly females not so much it's a very specific event so it's it's tough, it's but but tough. it's still it's really exciting, of course, for medical research. But I got very excited because I was thinking immediately not about woolly mammoths, but about rhinos. Yeah. yeah, and the fact that there are rhino species that are on the verge of extinction, and you might have female rhinos, but not male rhinos of the right species. You could get the right subspecies or species of rhino to um, to produce the right sperm based on a seed vault, essentially. And mm -hmm. then you could naturally, they could inseminate um, the female of the correct species, right? So mm -hmm. there, I think that is likely to come to fruition before any of these other already extinct animals get figured out. But um, it's pretty exciting. Yeah. If you've got the female of a species still living, mm -hmm. but not the male then, or a limited number of males, then that mm -hmm. could be the, the answer to that problem. Yeah. It can also prevent inbreeding and reduce genetic diversity if you have some mm -hmm. sperm in storage, basically. Yeah. I wonder what the... So here, mice and rats, they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're genetically very distinct, mm -hmm. but... The fact that you could that they were able to make these chimeras and it worked fairly well. Now I'm wondering, you know, what you know, what the distance could actually be between species for creating the chimeras successfully mm -hmm. and having the sperm work in this kind of manner. Um, you know. Muhaha. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. I'm not Dr. Eviling it here, really. But, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> um, you know, it's an interesting question, knowing what we know about human pig chimeras mm-hmm. and, yeah. uh, and, you know, other primates even, you know, what, yeah. could, it's a, what could be done. Yeah. It's actually uh, always somewhat fascinating to me that uh, there's not, that 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 it that, that it there is such a fall off between different species being able to to mingle and, and create a viable offspring because you would think one of the more conserved areas of biology would be reproduction, but of course it's also that thing that needs you know the the output of that needs to change so much depending on the environment that it's you know evolved to to inhabit that. It's, it is both, I think, probably a very conserved and maybe it's just the output, the thing that you're making mm-hmm. that is, that's causing the, the, the confluence of too many genes trying to do the same thing or, you know, anyway. Yeah. It's, I was also thinking about if this had, if they could take a step back, if this could be used in endangered species, if again, you have, if you have a reduced uh, genetic diversity, could you take the species difference away and use the same method to create a genetically distinct version of the same species. Right. Mm. And then, of course, I started thinking, about, I don't know if any of you have ever watched the cartoon show uh, Batman Beyond, but there's a whole storyline where um, <laughs> basically somebody gets injected with Bruce Wayne's DNA. And so he fathers a child through this other person and he doesn't know about it. <laughs> And it's basically this. Wow. <laughs> like, Whoa. They really... the, or so, that's the story he told. No, if no. You're that was a the billionaire whole, that was the with whole a deal. PR firm behind you. you <laughs> oh, I well, see, honey, what happened was. Well, anyway, there might be some scientific basis for this in the future. Is all I'm well, and this all can lead to wonderful pop culture and science fiction writing for yes, our future that's entertainment. Also true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is this week in science thank you so much for joining us for another episode if you are enjoying the show please head over to twist.org today and click on our patreon link and ha- help support the show you are a part of keeping this show going and we really can't do this without you thank you for your support all right, Justin, do you have some really good news? Like really, really good news? Well, I did promise in the first half of the show that the, my did. last, the final half uh, would be would be some good news. And so here we go. All the bad things are going on on the planet. Forget about it. <clears throat> uh, we humans occasionally do make an effort to move things in the general direction of not being as terrible as we have been in the past. The president of the United States signed an executive order announcing that his America, the beautiful plan, this was something signed a while ago, will conserve 30% of U.S. land and water by 2030. Scientists noticed that policy sounded pretty good, and they, they thought, hey, why don't we throw some science behind that and give some suggestions. So they've uh, in the, uh, put an article out in bioscience, a proposal for uh, West to r- sort of rewilding the Western network, comprising of 11 large reserve areas already owned by the federal government. The authors advocate for the secession of livestock grazing on some federal lands coupled with the restoration of some keystone species. Specifically, they are focused on the gray wolf and the North American beaver. And there have been examples of the past. They're not just sort of pulling a wishful thing. There have been places where wolf and beaver populations have been uh, brought back, and the effects on the, the biome there have been fantastic. So you've got wolves and beavers produce Broad ecosystem effects, according to the article. For instance, they say by felling trees and shrubs and building dams, beavers enrich fish habitat, increase water and sentiment, sediment uh, retention, maintain water flows during droughts, provide wet fire breaks, which reduces the spread of wildfires, 
improves water quality, except for PFAS, which they can't even get rid of. Increased carbon sequ uh, se sequestration. God, I can't talk today. <laughs> sequestration and generally enhance the habitat for many plants and animal species when the beavers are reintroduced. Wolves also have a potential to reshape ecosystems. They keep deer populations from overpopulating, which is an interesting side note, but even though Americans own more guns and more guns every year, less people hunt. There's millions of less hunters than there were just uh, 20 years ago. People, people don't really participate in hunting anymore. So by keeping deer populations from overpopulating, that allows native vegetation to regrow. They've found that foresting, forests tend to bounce back because whereas deer would normally be grazing the little seedlings that make up the forest, they tend to hide more when there's wolves around and don't go into those open areas where forests are starting to, uh, to push their way out with new seedlings. Also uh, in reducing the number of grandmothers uh, needed to visit would help reduce carbons in natural areas. The rewilding plan would produce profound cascading effects, say the authors, and it could ultimately benefit many of the 92 threatened and endangered species across nine taxonomic groups, five amphibians, five birds, two crustaceans, 22 fishes, 39 flowering plants, five insects, 11 mammals, one reptile, and three, uh-oh, make it two snail species that are currently endangered. Livestock, they say, would have to move along, to little doggy. Meat derived. This is interesting to think that, you know, because we talk, we hear a lot about uh, you'd be reclaiming these Bureau of Land Management, federal land, uh, where cattle have been allowed to graze for free or for, for very little. Meat derived from uh, foraging on federal lands only accounts for 2% of the nation's production of, of uh, meat in the first place. So <laughs> it's actually not as nearly as big as I would have guessed it to be. And then there's another story uh, out this week we were talking about, which is along the same, same vein in reclaiming nature for, for nature in the news. Bureau of Land Management, again, has granted a request by a nonprofit. Now, this is, I was talking about in the disclaimer, find a nonprofit, put some time and effort into it, uh, throw them some money or give them your expertise or just donate your, uh, your hours on the earth to helping them with a cause. This is a nonprofit called American Prairie, which has a herd of bison that it is returning to the lands. So... The Bureau of Land Management has granted them 24,000 hectares in central Montana, which is actually about the amount of land on fire in France right now. Uh, <laughs> it's a little warming. Oops. Huge fire there. Yeah. Uh, make, so, But this is the largest land approval the Bureau of Land Management has given to the American Prairie Organization. And many ecologists are celebrating for the first time in their lives. This is quoting ecologist Elizabeth Baker of Netherlands Institute of Ecology. We get a lot of bad news about declines of biodiversity. But then to see these really these things really gives you hope. It makes you think it is possible to restore these ecosystems and give the majestic animals the room they deserve. And she notes that the benefits go beyond bison to a host of prairie plants and other native animals. Ranching groups and state officials are less enthusiastic about the move, fearing the bison will compete with cattle for the almighty tourist dollar. Cattle producers in central Montana fear seeing land they exploited for generations but never owned nor stewarded return to the natural state of biodiversity in which they were originally uh, found. So according to BLM, there's actually plenty of land in Montana for both nature and cattle ranching, it's land as far as I can see. American Prairie would, aims to go ahead. Would, would, I, I'm, I'm just curious. I mean, cattle tourism? Is that a thing? Yeah, I was surprised. No, no, no. It is like, that was something I made up. But I'm like, well, of course, of course they're like, of course they're upset. They've got a, a free meal ticket for this land yeah. that their cattle can graze on that they don't have to do and anything the, uh, for. Right. Uh, 
And the bison might compete for the resources because mm-hmm. the bison are also grazers. Are using I mean, some I... of that land that yeah, they would yeah, normally yeah. be okay. able to free graze. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was like, <laughs> I try to let that one go by, but I'm glad you caught it. Because yeah, like that go by. Oh, the local, the local organizations in there in Central. I'm pretty sure cows about... look very similar in different states. <laughs> That They're freeway you're on. Economy. Oh, look, more cows. That's yeah. great. Okay. Well, the sort of joke there is that they, you know, obviously they are worried about a very specific self-interest pocketbook of themselves profiting from this. Yeah. Not the actual region of central Montana, yeah. which right. would actually probably benefit if people did go take a tour to see bison mm-hmm. in the natural uh, preserve, natural preserve. As opposed to nobody's driving there to see your cattle uh, wandering around, right? So it's it's in a way, it would be counterintuitive for them to be working against their own yeah. interests, but that's because uh, the local economy isn't necessarily their, their mm-hmm. own, own mm-hmm. interest. It's just their own particular economy. Uh, back in uh, Prairie, these folks seem to be pretty amazing. It, the organization already manages about 180,000 hectares of public and private land, uh, much of it former ranch land, which they now graze around 800 bison. And it's hoping to expand that number to 1,000 now that it has the extra space. They also go on to say grasslands, especially tall grass prairies, are some of the most endangered and least protected ecosystems in the world. They have received very little restoration efforts because Again, cattle farmers aren't doing that. It's a cattle farm ranchers, I guess you don't grow cattle. Some former prairie, uh, some of the former prairies are difficult to restore. Farmland, it's very difficult to get back to natural, pristine uh, uh, places. Uh, but the but cattle uh, grazing lands, the open lands that have just been used for cattle to wander around and graze on. Apparently, that's a much easier change. So that's what they've been. That's the land that they've been focusing on. So rewilding, reintroducing, proposal to reintroduce wolves and beavers to get the ecosystem looking good and bison coming back. I, you know, 30% of U.S. wild land being dedicated to nature again. Sounds like it I should hope be. I hope it all happens. Yeah. 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 seldom is heard the and discouraging just word. Thank you for not calling them buffalo. <laughs> they're not buffalo. They're bison. No. This yeah. is... So I I always have this question and I don't know it's a deficit of my memory. It's a separate thing. They're different species. It is a separate thing because buffalo every time live in we're Africa. Talking about bison, yeah, call them bison. It's perfect. So okay, but so the American it's always been buffalo, bison. It's always been on, bison. Hang on, the thing that we've been calling buffaloes in America is bisons. The buffaloes didn't go extinct, and now all we have is their cousins. There the were never buffalo in America. There were never buffalo. They were called but, bison. Yeah, but yeah. it's like, yeah. You know, it's a like lot koala that... bear. It is a misnomer. You need to get rid of it. They said it because they looked like buffalo in Africa. They are not related. Buffalo live in hamburger, Africa. Yeah, hamburgers Bison don't have hamburgers. I can, but I can. The U.S. But I think the weird thing is because of this information that you've given me, for somewhere along the line, I thought the American buffalo went extinct. But its cousin, which is different, the bison, still managed to survive. No. But if you no, tell no. me, well, we we did a good job at killing off the bison. For I mean, we did a really yeah. good job. We just didn't quite. Get it. There's still some left. Yeah, cousins, big mm-hmm. bisons, mm-hmm. big bison. Oh yeah. Oh, you know what? You know what? Help me remember it. Good old bison bills traveling western show. Yeah, yeah there you go. The... There Perfect. There you go, bison bill. Well, beyond Buffalo, uh, I mean, this this episode's focused a lot on the environment and how how we are affecting the environment, climate change, and all these kinds of things. Well, we've heard, I think last week or so, there was news floating around that all the turtles in Florida are becoming female because of hotter temperatures mm-hmm. and climate change. Well, this week, it's not turtles. Lizards are in trouble as a result of climate change. A new study published in the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences, PNAS, have determined that lizards, which bear live young, 
in hotter environments are giving birth to offspring with shorter telomeres. So from the point of birth, the baby lizards are older genetically. So the telomeres we've talked about before, Blair, you know, we love the telomeres. We want them to be nice and happy and long. Mm -hmm. And as you get mm -hmm. older, your telomeres, the little end caps little on the, mm -hmm. like on the ends of the shoelaces, they get shortened and shortened and shortened and shortened. Every time that your cells divide, those telomeres get broken down, especially once tel telomerase, the enzyme that protects the telomeres stops working. Well, the hot temperatures these researchers uh, determined, they, uh, they focused on 10 populations of common lizards, Zotica vivipara, also known as the viviparous lizard, which means that they give birth to live young. They live throughout the massive central mountains in France. And they looked over these uh, the period of the study, looking at blood and tissue samples from hundreds of individuals, finding that those in hotter places had babies with shorter telomeres. And based on the extent of the damage, it's unlikely that many of those individuals would live long enough to reproduce. Wow. That is the killer. Oh, that is the killer. That's that, the species killer. Yes. And that is the species killer. So the researchers suggest that there are actually uh, there during the course of the study, there was one particular population in the warmest area, an area around Mount Montcaru in France, that it disappeared entirely, and uh, the researchers are calling it uh, what in scientific terminology is pseudo-extinct. That doesn't mean that it's like fake extinct. It means that a species went extinct while its related daughter species, other lineages that were related to it actually continue living on. So there's kind of like a hole in the phylogeny. Um, yeah, the researchers say it's something that's happening at a very, very rapid pace. So, hey, thanks, climate change and hot temperatures. You're making babies with old cells that can't li live long enough to have other babies. <sighs> I thought oh, we were going to end the show with the right good times. news. Oh, right. I thought oh, right, we were right. doing all good right. news. Good news, good news, good news. Okay. Um, right, Blair. Yes. I learned from big brown bats how you can live longer. Yes. Give me. Okay. Big brown bats live longer because they hibernate. And because they hibernate, they have slower epigenetic changes. So while we're alive, we experience lots of stuff and there's lots of uh, mutations that occur, little shifts that happen and markers, methylations on our DNA that uh, tie things up and make them make it make them harder or easier to turn into proteins depending on the on the gene that we're talking about but epigenetic changes lead to faster aging and if you want to not age as fast you don't want as much epigenetic changes going on while you're living well anyway ep ep he's eptizicus there we go eptizicus fuscus the big brown bat uh lives longer with fewer epigenetic changes because of hibernation. Hibernation slows its metabolism and allows it to live longer. So Blair, if you want to live longer, you need to hibernate. Well, I don't think my work will let me do that. <laughs> Maybe we can start working for it. It's not just the four-day work week. It's hibernation season. Yeah, just like teachers, it. right? It's, I really, I gotta go into torpor. See you all in six to eight weeks. <laughs> That's it. Oh, <laughs> I think. Man. A, I mean, the Europeans already have it right. They take a month off in the summer. It's perfect. Hold my calls. I'm not answering my emails. Huh. We're not coming back. Um, and finally, 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 let's talk about sleep because it's the end of the show, and I know I don't want to put anybody to sleep, but. Researchers looking at brains are very interested in how brains fall asleep. And so 
Um, some researchers that recently published, again, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, they paired fMRI research with EEG research. So they got the electrical activity of the brain also at the same time that they were getting the uh, the blood flow in the brain, which is a proxy for neuronal activation. And they were able to use these two different kinds of imaging to really get a good resolution view, space and time of how neurons, or well, not, not specific neurons, but areas of the brain were active during falling asleep. I mean, it's a little weird. They put people in fMRI machines wearing EEG caps and said, hey, oh. take a nap. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> the hum of that machine, though, it's just, yeah. oh, it's perfect. Oh, yeah, I could, I could do it right away. <laughs> yeah. No problem. Yeah, just it's so comfortable and cozy. I'd probably have to stay awake for three days ahead of time to fall asleep in one of those machines. But the people who did, there might be, that's what I'm, I'm pointing out, is there could be a, conf a confounding factor mm -hmm. that, that people were sleeping in these machines. So it yeah. could affect the way that the sleep occurred. But what the researchers were able to determine were specific populations of neurons and the order in which they were falling or becoming inactive or less active during the stages of sleep. And so the researchers determined that uh, area, that while you're falling asleep, that initially drifting off to sleep, the thalamus is the first region to show sleep associated blood flow patterns. And this also kind of fits in with lots of other research that the thalamus and our emotions and all that kind of stuff and the basal brain areas um, are kind of the first thing to get tired and start putting everything to, to sleep. Um, but interestingly, that was not the area of the brain that woke up first. So the areas of the brain that woke up first were the frontal cortical regions of the brain, which are associated with attention mm -hmm. and, um, and, and cognitive activity. Well, this is like going to keep you from getting attacked just, in your sleep, right? Like that's the first thing that has to, has to happen if you got to wake up quickly to protect yourself. Right. No, which leads thing, to if, if there's people a line in my punching other people. <laughs> there's, a line in my, yeah. Yeah. there's a line in my apartment. First thing I need to do is go find coffee so I can be awake enough to handle it. I think it's just, a, right. I, I mean, well, I that, that's a chemical <laughs> dependency. That's a confounding variable for sure. <laughs> but it's, but it's to, to, uh, to, but it's tied to attention, right? I mean, yeah, it's it is. Like, yes, it's, tied to yeah, attention yeah. and cognitive processing. But so yeah. it's going to be very, in, as you first wake up, I imagine that instead of being just emotionally, you mm -hmm. know, responsive you want to be more aware like you said blair of what's around so justin is there coffee has the coffee machine started yet yes is it worth getting out of bed right now right you know so you have those realizations first or you know is there an intruder in the house am i sleeping in a big fmri machine yes. you know what's, what's yeah. going what's on sound? around me yeah, Am I so stuck? that awareness becomes the attention, the awareness, the processing starts, and then the emotional stuff uh -huh. will come in later, you know, as the, as the brain wakes up. Uh, I'm wondering. It's interesting if, that it's backwards. If on the other side, if because the emotional stuff is the first to go to sleep, if that's why, if you're stressed, if you're anxious, if you're upset, if you're even you really happy and amped, yeah, you like, you can't go to sleep. It's, it's like. It's the gatekeeper almost if it has yeah. to go to bed, go to sleep first. That's really interesting. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Calm the basal brain. Yeah. Calm that down. Use your cognitive processing mm -hmm. to slow the basal brain. Then the basal brain can calm down and allow the rest of the brain to fall asleep. This mm -hmm. is making a lot of sense. This is so, where you fall so asleep this... during meditation. Is because you're like... Or math class. <laughs> <laughs> but not during twists. Math class, I get excited. Oh, let me solve that equation. I love you. That's <laughs> the best. Thank you for the whiteboard. <laughs> I know the answer to that question. Oh, <laughs> I miss math class. Have we done it? Yes. Have, have we, have we uh, stimulated our frontal cortical regions enough? 
this evening? I think so, yes. Yeah, yeah you think? All right. Well, I think we've done it as well. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for another episode of This Week in Science. We have finished the show, and it's time for us to go. So I would like to say thank you to Fada for your help with show notes and social media, helping out with all of those things that you do. Gord, Arn Lore, others. Make sure that the chat rooms are nice places. Thank you for being here and for doing that. Identity Four, who's not here tonight. Thank you for usually recording the show. We really, really need you recording the show, and we appreciate your help doing that. And Rachel, thank you for editing and for all of your other assistance. And thank you to our Patreon sponsors. Do, 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 do. Thank you to Teresa Smith, James Schaefer, Richard Badge, Kent Northcote, Rick Loveman, Pierre Velazar, Ralph E. Figueroa, John Ratnaswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Karen Tazi, Woody M.S., Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vigard, Chef Stad, Hal Snyder, Donathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, John Lee, Ali Coffin, Gaurav Sharma, Reagan, Derek Schmidt, Don Mundus, Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fredis 104, Sky Luke, Paul Runovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Jack, Brian Carrington, Matt Bates, Beat it, Boat, Beto for Texas, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenflow, Gene Tellier, Steve Leesman, aka Z, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Dana Pearson, Richard, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Remy Day, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, Artyom, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Deb Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Rick Ramos, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Eric, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, E.O., Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luth and Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul Disney, David Simmerly, Patrick Pecoraro, Tony Steele, and Jason Roberts. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. And if you are interested in supporting us on Patreon, Head over to twist.org and click on the Patreon link. On next week's show. We will be back Wednesday at 8 p.m. Pacific time. And another show Thursday at 5 a.m. Central European time. Broadcasting live from our YouTube and our Facebook channels and from twist.org slash live. That's next Thursday, not tomorrow, right? No. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, Thursday, got it. Thursday. <laughs> I just want to clarify because it's still Wednesday in the United States right now. All right. Anyway, um, do you want to listen to us as a podcast? Maybe while you wake up for your day and activate your awareness part of your brain, just search for This Week in Science over podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe as well. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes and links to stories will be available on our website, www.twist.org. You can contact us directly, email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at blairbaz at twist.org. Don't get those suffixes confused. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, in the subject line, or your email will be spam filtered into a baby jumping spider's dreams. Aww. Yeah. Aww. How cute. You can also hit us up on the Twitter which is the thing where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember... It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say I use the scientific method for all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's this week in science This week in science
This week in science, science, science. 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 This week in science, this week in science. This week in science, 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 science. science. I've got one disclaimer, and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just that understand. And we are at the end of the show. In fact, we're in the after show. We've done it. We've done it. Gone to the after. The after show. Into the after. We should have an uh, like an after show seance <laughs> instead of science. <laughs> Who are we going to try to talk to? Um, Carl Sagan. <laughs> He doesn't believe in seances. No. He's like, even if he heard you, he'd be like, nah. It's not a seance, it's a science. Oh, I get it. All right. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Do you mean, hold on. Oh, I it. Do you <laughs> mean up. waka waka waka? Waka waka waka. That's right. Waka waka waka. Anyway. Uh, how far north could I go for cool weather, Eric Knapp? Says I can go to Utkiakvik. I can't even say it, but I could be a teacher. I could teach mm. science in an Alaskan school district. Ut. I forget the Q is a different sound, isn't it? In the oh boy. Uh, I don't know how to print. I don't know how to print. We had a whole conversation about this one day. I remember talking about how the how the pronunciations go. Jalik sauce. Thank you so much for joining us over on Twitch. Oh, Iron Lore would science with Harry Houdini. Hmm. That's fun. Who would you science with out there, everyone? Do I have a universal translator? Yes, yes, yes. You've got a babble fish. Yes. Okay, great. Then probably Socrates. <laughs> I just want to hear him we'll talk try. about how everyone else is stupid. And <laughs> he was, he was, he went, he marched to his death knowing he was getting murdered for a stupid reason. And he just, the eye roll, I could only imagine. <laughs> I just, I think he'd be real saucy. Super saucy. I think yeah. so. Yes. The snark on, on Socrates would be high, I think. I have a mouth. I have a mouth. Yeah, Ooh. so uh, we have kitties. We have kitties. All kitties are accounted for this week. No missing kitties. Good. Is, yes. Big Where was she you. hiding? Where was she? Oh, my gosh. She's hidden a number of times in the last week. So I'm like, which, <laughs> which hiding place was she in? <laughs> She was in a box. <laughs> Jeez. Of course she was. She wouldn't come out and she was angry and she was stressed out because we just moved and she didn't mm -hmm. eat. She wasn't coming out for food. Oh, so this is cat behavior. Yes. That's really fascinating that I've discovered. Um, apparently cats, when they go through what they consider traumatic or stressful experiences mm -hmm. they associate they can associate another cat that they're totally friends with usually with that trauma and because of that they can then when they come near each other they they hiss they want to fight they don't like oh that cat God. anymore because they are now but they've you were with me during that trauma it's your fault <laughs> are are your cats related no they're sisters okay they're sisters they've been together since they were born and all of a sudden with this move, they decided that they hated each other. And so for several days, I had to keep them in different rooms every time they even came like down the hallway from one another. There was hissing and Ugh. yowling and yeah, it, yeah, R and Laura, it was kitty PTSD. They oh, and boy. they were they were both fine with all the people in the family and we're the ones who subjected them to the trauma but in their world 
it was all about them and how much they did not like the fact that the other one was associated with the trauma that they'd been through. Uh, this is bad. Yeah. But anyway, they're better oh, now. They aren't hiding as much. They like each other. Well, they don't li- love each other again, but they are now able to be within feet of each other. Not They don't kiss each other all the time. It's... I read articles on, of course, you know, you go to the internet. Mm-hmm. Why is my cat acting like this? And some people were talking about how their cats would, uh, wouldn't talk to each other for months and it, how it took them months to get their cats to associate with each other again. So I was, I was waiting. Do I have a cat naming convention? Um, no, I haven't been able to reserve a uh, convention hall for something like that. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, my cats were named uh, very loosely around space-themed things because of my son. And he mm-hmm. spacey things. My cats are females. And yes, I know females can spray, but they've both been fixed. They don't spray. And they're not gonna, they weren't going to spray the house, Fada. My cat, they, they're going to rub their cheeks all over it. But if I found out that my cats were spraying the house, I'd be kind of pissed. <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, fixed female cats can spray too. It's true. I don't know. I've been... I am knocking on this bamboo desk (laughs) that they don't spray. We have all the cats. All the cats are good. They're coming along in terms of the household. Nice. Yes. It's all getting better. Oh, dear. We need to get rid of that person who's spamming. Who's that? <laughs> Who's that spam put block user? Hi, go away, person. Is that all the same person? Oh my goodness. Yowzers. Yeah. Best adult dating site. Banhammer. Prove it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, I love emojis and everything, but. That's a bold claim. I need data. <laughs> you need data. <laughs> that would be some interesting research. <laughs> Yikes. Uh. <laughs> How's it going over there, Justin? You awake? Got enough coffee? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Totally wide awake. Uh, several cups learn- of coffee. Sun's out. Have you out. learned Danish yet? Nice. No, 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 no not at all. <laughs> uh, I went. I went to the the. I think the most unnecessary in person meeting I've ever attended. Oh no! Uh, which Sorry. is to to sign up for the for the basic Danish classes that I'm going to be taking. Um, I had to go and meet with somebody to assess my level of Danish language ability, mm-hmm. which was none. <laughs> Basically. You're like, this is they, why I'm taking the class. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking for your basic class. Uh, how much Danish do you speak? None. Okay. Well, let's start you out with a basic class. Okay. Great idea. Like, it was really... It was really like it, it seems like a, I mean there's a there's a it's it's, uh, it's there's a reason for it it's you know it's it's a free education which is very awesome and cool that they provide this uh, uh, and so but they, so there is a layer where they assess where you belong so they put you in the right class and everything but but because it was none I'm just like yeah I really I don't I can oh, eat tell dance. <laughs> Did you get to say talk for coffee? Talk for coffee. I mean, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I can tell a dance. Yeah, yeah, I can eat for sto. I can I can speak Danish. I just don't understand it. And oh. and it's it's uh 
That's funny. I feel like it's usually the other way around. Usually well, cognition goes before speaking. So so part of this, a two-tiered problem here. Part of the problem is it is, while a Germanic language uh, at its core, it is non-phonetic. Not, or at least it's not the, the phonetics of oh, the so English Oh, so you don't at understand all. the written can't read it. is what you're saying. Can't read it at Got all. It. And and they have three more vowels than we do. And they, ha and they have sounds and intonations that do not occur in the English language that are very hard to hear. The, 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 oh, it's just, it's almost endless when, when somebody's uh, trying to help you pronounce something and you're repeating exactly what they're saying, but apparently with different letters or different, different phonetics, because you can't, I'm not hearing my ears uh -huh. just not trained to, uh, to comprehend the sound that was just made. And so it fills in a sound I'm familiar with, which is different. So it's, it's, it's going to be tough. I'm telling you. Oh, gosh. But I don't have to get uh, to, to the, the, you know, the basic class shouldn't be shouldn't be an unachievable level of Danish to be able to speak. Hmm. I should be able to uh, walk into any establishment and uh, and 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 use a, a few phrases of the Danish that I've picked up to progress to the point where they just start speaking English to me. Because that's usually what happens. Almost everyone I encounter here speaks English pretty fluently. So it's it's also that whole immersion thing. It's not working. Because no, nobody's going to, oh, you're butchering my language. Let me just use yours more eloquently than you speak it. Oh, okay, that's that what, would be the, fine. That's Why what not? you find. Yeah, you go and they go, oh, I'll speak English. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and uh, you know, and higher higher uh, university levels are often taught in English. So, and there's a lot of higher education here. But it's even, you know, it's you don't have to be in an academic setting. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the person working the grocery store line speaks fluent English, English. for yeah. some un, uncomprehensible reason. It. And, yeah, they do, and I'm very thankful. In school. I blame Hollywood. I blame Hollywood. I think that's... I think it's because they're a part of Europe, and it makes it easier for them all to interact. You know, but no, European, there's no English. European nation that speaks English. Uh, the entire UK. Ah, not, not Europe anymore. Well, <laughs> Ireland, come on. Okay, <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. You've got that. Fair enough, fair enough. If you call that English, I guess you have a point. Yeah, yeah. You, <laughs> maybe, can you find a, maybe just do a conversation partner? Like, go No, on. I have that. I have that. And and it's still, so there's a, there's a, a varying degrees of Danglish that are spoken at home. Mm -hmm. uh, combination of mostly English with a decent amount of Danish thrown in. I've got post-it notes okay. uh, all over the place. Oh, uh, and it's sometimes fun because the the translations for things are sometimes very similar to the roots of words, but uh, a light switch is a stick contact. Stick contact. Yeah, you know, it's like, okay, I get where how you came to that. It's just very literally describing the thing. Uh, you know, stick contact. That's a light switch. Okay. Well, that shouldn't be light? too hard to... Huh? What's a light? I have no idea. <laughs> but it's... <laughs> how would you say it... turn on the light? <laughs> I don't know. But it's, it's probably... Uh... Oh, yeah, I don't know how to do it. I know how to turn it off. Uh, I salute my dad, no. Yeah, close that now. Yeah, we're down, we're down for that. Luma that no. Close that I learned, now. Well, I, I had a I had a long time ago. I had a dog that spoke Danish or understood Danish. It didn't speak Danish. That would be that would have been really amazing. Uh, I had a dog that understood Danish, so I you know I I I can communicate to the dogs in Denmark just just fine. But we do have kicks. Ah, nice. Eek, piece of that. How do keeks come to new? 
stuff like that. Uh, it's fine. But uh, you don't yeah, have any kikis? <laughs> What's keeks? I know. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Oh, keeks. It's like a, a cracker biscuit treat. It's kind of a catch-all oh. for like a cracker or a dog treat. Dog treat, great. But or for humans too, though. It's, <clears throat> They don't have a lot. Of, what is a great name? They don't really have a lot. I don't see. You don't see big dogs here. Everything's small in this country. It's like very. Mm. You know, the people are normal size, but all of their things are like Lilliputian style, like small dogs, small cars. Oh, but big bikes. Their bikes are huge because they're usually. You know, they can be traveling with a family of four on a single bicycle as they go around. I'm trying to imagine a family of four on a bicycle right now. <laughs> it's a very they big have, bicycle. And they have not stopped. Like um, in America, we stopped inventing the bicycle once it got to two wheels. Yeah, you got your BMX, your road bike, whatever. But yeah. but still, they have they have uh, they use them for transportation. So they have these really long bikes with baskets. The you know apartments where people can sit in who are passengers and you know car. And they'll be twice as long as a regular bike. It might be electric powered. They might be uh, three wheeled contraptions or two wheeled contraptions with just giant carts in the front. There's all sorts of like interesting looking bikes here. That's that's one of the amazing things is there's so many bikes. And oh, I found out too. I've been finding out that uh, if you're in a bike lane uh, with a stroller, you don't have the right of way. You would think. You would think. You know babies have the right of way and then well maybe and then you know then it's like people in wheelchairs or you know uh you know you need assistance uh, getting about then pedestrians and somewhere in there maybe uh children in in wheelchairs but uh and then pedestrians and then and then bicycles because it technically would be a vehicle right you know right. When, you're, when you're navigating the roadways nope Nope, bicycles first. All other modes of transportation or humans on foot second. Sort of like the way Americans are with cars having babies the right crawling. Away. Nope, forget nope. about the babies. Get them out of the way. Bikes first. Yeah. Rick Loveman says uh, Davis, my hometown, has a few bikes. It's the highest per capita bike use in the United States. It's bike capital of the world. I'd love to know if the... that's still accurate because I know. Yes, we beat Portland. We beat Portland. Yes. <laughs> Yes, we beat Portland. Do you they, keep they tabs hit... on this every yes, single year? Yes, like you're like, yes, this is the competition. I, we got to know. Davis every year comes out, <laughs> comes out officially Who with a new report bicycles? confirming. And if anything should change or if we start to lose ground, they then force everybody people goes to and bike. steals more they bikes bike, from Portland. They have a bike yeah. giveaway program. They get more people on. So, the Justin, the I have. I have good uh, and bad news. So uh, Davis is the bike capital of the United States. Thank you. Amsterdam is the bike capital of the world. There we go. I'm telling you, if, if, if they have more bike use per capita than the city of Davis, I will be, I mean, we have been, I, I will admit we've been losing ground. We've been losing ground. I know we have because, yeah, because it used to be the bike bigger, rack, right? Everywhere were full to the point where you had bikes that were getting locked up to parked cars. It was just ran out of bike racks. But it it seems like that's gone down, probably with the pandemic. A lot of places have gone. Apparently, Denmark has got a lot more vehicular traffic and car sales went up during the pandemic because everything is public transportation. You don't you really don't need a car here. But because people wanted to the, the isolate uh, a lot of cars. So, I just found uh, so you're right. Sorry. Thank you. No, I, I, I just found move. Am I about the, per capita? Is that, Hold did on. you look it up? Let, let Kiki oh. go. I'll chime in after. Oh, but I wanted to be right about something. That <laughs> seems way more important than anything anybody else was going to say. <laughs> so I didn't go ahead. So in the United States, I found a list that says that Portland has the highest percentage of bicycle commuters, 6.3%. Oh. It's, it's a lie. But it's cities. It, I don't know if Davis would it's a lie. count. It's not on. Davis I don't isn't think even they on the put, list. 
Right. Davis isn't on the that list, but the list that Davis makes, they definitely put Davis on that same list. <laughs> and that's how they know that they're the they're bike capital of the world. Let's see. Uh I found another one. The Netherlands is the country with the most cyclists. The city with the most cyclists is Copenhagen. Oh, yeah. They're all up over. To 60, that's, that's the, up to 62% right of the population use a bicycle for the daily commute to work or school, yeah. cycling an average of 894,000 miles every day. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and you know, the way, there's trains uh, that go everywhere, right? The train system is very, very central to Copenhagen. Uh, and there's whole cars that are basically bike racks. So you take your bike onto the train, park it in the bike rack on the train, and then, you know, you get where you're going, you, you go back off on your bike again. So it's, uh, it's a great system. Yeah. So, Blair, so you were going to say I was right about the, something. The problem is there are different metrics. So yep. if, so you were saying about per capita and yes. you're right. As far as I can tell, Davis has the most per capita because there are two bikes Woo! for every human. Yeah. <laughs> but there are about 50,000 bikes in affluent, Davis. also I guess. Yeah. There, and, and no, you have to have your road down. bike and your mountain bike. Yeah. Yeah, road so, bike, mountain um, bike. So there are 50,000 bikes in Davis. There are almost 900,000 bikes in Amsterdam. Wow. Yeah, but it's a it's a gigantic it's metropolis a bigger city. sprawling. Right. And so yeah. the the per capita is more like one and a half. Still more yeah, than one, which is weird. So, so part of the part of the per capita uh, reason why there's two bikes per person in Davis too is I think also a metric maybe because Davis has a population of about fifty thousand people, uh, not including the university students, which is yes. students, which is a population of about thirty thousand people, right? Uh, who mostly rely on bikes to get around. So I'm kind of wondering. Uh, when they do that thing, uh, what they're looking at, but, but Davis is small enough also that you can have a bike and get everywhere in town. And it's a town that was designed with the bicycle in mind. The town logo is a bicycle, but there's green belts that are designed for bike, uh, travel that connect all of the parts of town everywhere. So you can even ride your bike. They have bike lanes, which again, I think was invented in Davis. They have bike lanes. That's a thing every, almost every, on every street. But they also have dedicated paths where bikes can go and don't even have to interact with traffic and cars. The question like that. that Fada has asked in, uh, in, in our Discord, which mm. Patreon uh, patrons get to be a part of uh does davis have a yearly naked bike ride mm. <laughs> san francisco does really it does no. i didn't know san francisco did that's cool yeah. no yeah, oh, portland no, it's, it's, it is the so, largest naked yeah. bike ride of course. so that's that's something <laughs> that you'll you'll find in a in a place like portland or san francisco where you have a Let's say a population that uh, Portland it, likes its motto, it, which is "Keep Portland Weird." That a population that or not a pop uh, that that can go outside without their clothes on, uh, without getting scorched by <laughs> the ever blazing intensity I, of there, the sun that there comes are seasons, to the city of Davis. There are seasons in Davis when that scorching is not quite as intense. Oh. So they did the naked bike ride in the in the dead of winter uh, when that we have. There's those a season couple... called spring. Oh, it's <laughs> spring is a hundred degrees in Davis now. So I mean, the global warming <laughs> thing hit there fast. It got yeah. there right away. It's That's it used much. to be you'd have those three days in in late July or August where you know uh, early July yeah. to August where it was three days a hundred and ten degrees in a row. Uh, mm -hmm. now, now that starts in spring and doesn't end until sometime in, uh, October, September, November. October. Oh, <laughs> like, should go, I go. see what temperature it is in Davis? Um, not right now, but like what the, right now it's was. only 70 degrees. Um, yeah, let me look, let me see what the high it, was today. It co cools down to 70 degrees at night. At night. The yeah. high today was 92. 
Yeah, actually, not a bad day. Ooh, that's a that's nice tomorrow. Day. Yeah. 94, Friday, 95, Saturday, 97, Monday, 99, Tuesday, 103. Going so, an uncharacteristically uh, mild summer. <laughs> no, I mean, the no. summer is usually like 90s. I could, but like it's that not over. Anymore. It's over that that not over a hundred. You have not. You have not lived I there, been there for a while. while. It's wow. it, it. It will get into the triple digits and just stay there for weeks. <laughs> it, it with no wind, no wind. Just oh, it's bad. It sounds awful. And then the and then the Delta breeze will come. But in it's a like, dry oh. heat. Yes. It's yes. A dry so, heat. So Denmark has, I uh, guess, been having a, an unseasonably warm. Summer, and yeah. I'm I'm sweatier than I've been. Is in it humid? It's so humid because it's uh, it's a it's a little uh, island, little uh, barely barely even enough to put both feet uh, on dry ground, uh, surrounded by sea, uh, seawater. So, <laughs> so it's Friend. it's very humid, and there's no air conditioning. That's the other thing. Nobody has an air conditioning. There's more air con. Oh, not in Denmark. I was going to no. say in Davis, everyone has air conditioning oh, yeah. now. You die. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you have to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Alameda is also. Uh, Alameda is in the Bay Area, right on the water. So. If you want to yeah. go someplace really interesting, island life. Go to is it is it uh, Pacifica? Yeah. Is it, uh, it's, it's often foggy there. Yeah. Pacifica. I, I have left the city of Davis where it was 104. Yeah. Drove through muggy San Francisco in the mid 90s. Oh, jeez. And then and then gotten down to Pacifica where you couldn't see the sun and the fog. Yeah, you is need a raincoat. Yeah, in the middle of the day, it's it is the 50 most degrees. Insane yeah. microclimate <laughs> uh, I've ever I've ever witnessed that could be so surrounded by just dramatically different weather. And then be yeah, yeah, sweater weather. Yeah, so whenever it gets into those triple digits, that's where I go. I go to Pacifica. <laughs> now you've given up your secret. It's gonna be yeah, crowded. yeah. It, it gets a little crowded anyway. It's fine. Yeah, it's okay. It's worth. It's worth it. Where did Blair go? Alaska. It's a dry, cold. <laughs> that's funny <laughs> very accurate but funny <laughs> it's cold but it's a dry cold it's a dry it's cold like yeah. does that mean it's not as cold does that mean it's colder so did we establish davis is in fact the bike capital of the world and, and the hottest of the, place. Of the u.s <laughs> and now of the world per capita uh, come on Amsterdam. almost nine hundred thousand bikes it's in per Amsterdam. capita it's Who says capita. that's what makes you the bike capital? Because it's it's how much it's being used. You can't just Whoa. go in size, otherwise China gets everything. <laughs> that's Beijing. Beijing, I guarantee you, has more bicycles. No, I don't it think is, so. That's what I, I found. I guarantee you they have more bicycles. It's the per capita thing that's making no. Amsterdam. Good. Yeah. There's... There's cities with 14, 15, 20 million people on this planet. Singapore, I don't know how many tens of millions of people live in Singapore alone. That they have to just by the sheer numbers game, there's going to be more bicycles present. Doesn't mean they're, uh, the, it's the per capita. That's how you do it. And also things like bike lanes and I think green belts also should put you uh, up in that category, which Portland does a really good job of with a lot of their bike paths and stuff but yeah no davis still wins and yeah i need to verify this one because i think it's true and it might not be but i'm pretty sure it is i think davis invented the bike lane what there was no bike lanes in san francisco there was no bike lanes in any city i'd ever visited but when they probably i probably originated davis. not in the united states like i i <laughs> think i think davis had a uh, dedicated bike lanes before they existed yeah. anywhere else on the planet, bike lanes. I could be wrong, but I know they were. I know they had them when in I grew 1896. Up. The first oh, bikeway in the United States was created by splitting the pedestrian way of Ocean Parkway in Brooklyn. Brooklyn, okay, that's a bikeway. That's different. That's like a green <laughs> belt. That's <laughs> not. That's not a bike lane, which is a lane. You said bike lane. bike lane, bike lane, which is the lane dedicated to bikes 
between the car traffic and the sidewalk. That's a bike lane, not a bike path, not a bike Los way. Angeles had construction on the first, the world's first bike highway in 1900. You can see how long that lasted. Yeah, okay. Hmm. <laughs> okay, okay. There is a, a City of Davis history. Of course, this is written in City of Davis so it's done by rational people who looked at the rest of the world and <laughs> by late 1967 here we go mm -hmm. uh let's see in 1966 norm woodbury and maynard skinner were elected to davis city council after advocating support for bicycle lanes yeah. By June 1967 they joined then mayor kent gill to approve the very first davis bicycle lanes a subsequent bill established the right for California cities to install bike lanes was also passed by the California state legislature and signed by then governor Ronald Reagan. By late July, 1967, the very first official bike lane in Davis and in the United States was created <laughs> on eighth street between a street and Sycamore lane. What's fun? And here it is. Here it is. It was the first time that a lane for the preferential use of bicyclists had been designated at, as part of an existing roadway meant for vehicles. So oh, I God, found something again? else. No, I, found, I think we should stop right there because that's okay. Sounds but like I found that in 1934, yeah. oh, London yeah. created um, a segregated piece of arterial roadway next to where cars go four bicycles and there's a there's a video and it's someone on a penny farthing so like what cars? that's the city of davis symbol is a is a high wheeler mm -hmm. yeah penny farthing this, high wheeler. this looks I mean, legit this is this really looks like 1930s they made a bike lane bike. in the road in london I, I feel like this is a lot of because splitting hairs over car. whether or not it's a path or splitting it off of a car lane like this is Thank goodness that people are trying to make it safer for bicyclists to get around and to make bicycling a more preferred mode of transportation. Isn't that great? That's great. It is. It is. Although I really, 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 really detest riding a bicycle on a windy day. It, it's it, like riding it uphill. Very dangerous. Like Nothing it. is good on a windy day. I'd rather like it, it rain than, uh, than the wind. Yeah. People, come, people, people get allergies when it's windy. Yeah, you know, your hair is all messed up. You know what the best commuting mode is? Walking downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> that must be nice for you. So sounds dangerous. <laughs> Meanwhile, I spend so much time in my car now. No. Oh. Could you ride a Split. bike? Oh, you know what I'm saying? How long would hair it take? Uh, if I took the bus, I think it would take me I'd like three hours to get to work. Yikes. Because I'd have to take a local bus to, I think, another bus mm. to the Caltrain. And then I'd have to take two different buses from Caltrain on the other end. It, it would be like three to five different vehicles. It'd be insane. Yeah, it's too complicated. That makes it too complicated. Yeah. This is why cars still yeah. work for so many is, people. If yeah. there was a clear path to Caltrain on either end, I could yeah. park at Caltrain and drive like two miles every day. Yeah. But I can't. So you know, well, that's the thing too, is I'm a very vehicle centric person. Like I never want to be without a car. And you I mean Ever. you sold cars. For years. I sold cars for years, but not out of a love of cars. That was just because it was, it was, they happened to have car dealerships on the edge of Davis, which is a bike town. And it was, it was a good local job. I could care less about cars in, in a lot of respects, but I love driving to places when I go, think, to go anywhere. And, you know, especially when you're having uh, children and stuff, you want to be able to, Hey, if somebody have, you want to be able to jump in a car and go there. You don't want to be like, Oh, what's that? Uh, somebody got hurt at school. Let me go jump on my bike. Mm -hmm. Right. Up. You know, there's, there's reasons that I would prefer cars over any other mode of transportation. But that said, 
Oh my goodness, there are some really cool bikes in Denmark that even in the city of Davis, even the bike capital of the world, the inventor of the bike lane, the highest usage per person anywhere in the world, there's so many bikes that we don't have in Davis that would totally catch on. These There are some amazing, like if I had some of these bikes with the electric assist and the saddlebags and the cart for the groceries and the put four people on the sides and oh man i would i would have i'd just take one of those everywhere i might have to they cost as much as a car though that's mm -hmm. <laughs> it's true or it's like a half a car yeah but it's a half a car and you have a really cool bike yeah they're i mean yeah they're good some at least a couple thousand dollars for those elect at least the electric ones yeah Gloria says, I'm surprised you say that after seeing the European public transport infrastructure. No, it's great. You don't need a car here. You just don't. I just, I just, I think, I think there's also coming from a small town in America. Uh, getting the keys to your first car and being able to head out on the open road to the big city where the action is or up to the country where the wilderness is still wild. Suburbs haven't even been thought of yet. Uh, there's something there. There's some sort that? of some the sort suburbs of suburbs haven't even been thought of in the public transportation no. plan. No, they don't even <laughs> they don't even have suburbs up there in the up in the Sierras. And they don't in the big city, oh they got all the action. Everything's going on there. Nobody's sleeping. It's exciting. Not like your small, sleepy town in middle America where I grew up. With with also with also a university as our core industry, therefore also everywhere is scary because people aren't uh, educated, which is too bad. Which is nice thing or, about the or they're educated and that's why they're there. <laughs> now that's not been my experience. Although that is one thing I, I do like about uh, uh, also about Denmark. It's probably I mean Davis also another thing. Fun fact: City of Davis highest per capita of PhDs in the United States. Yep. Ooh, how Except do you like for that? Maybe Livermore. Nope. Nope. Oh, but it's not really like if you're talking about a research compound where they it's like <laughs> it's a town. Oh, and that's oh. where they all that's where everybody lives. They're like, okay, oh look, I, I guess live in Livermore. And then I go and fair. I study nuclear warheads. Yeah, I guess that might yeah. be fair. I don't know if that's true. They may be maybe vying for well, okay. So uh where is that though? What that's in a foreign state though, isn't it? One of those uh, succession of states. Well, highest per capita PhDs city in California, 100% for sure. Uh, but there's a really high level of education in Denmark because education, higher education is universal. It's paid. You go. They invest in their people. So it's kind of nice here. Lots of smart people. Invest taking care in of their your city. people and your country your will their prosper. We could write a song books. about it. 50 mm -hmm. cities with the most doctoral degree holders. Number one is Davis. It's not on the list because they don't compare themselves to us because they don't know what, that Davis exists because it's too small. Brookline, we... Massachusetts. That makes sense. Number two, Davis, Damn. California. Oh, we got knocked down to number two. You know what? We need to get rid of some of the slackers. Actually, so, I left. Robin I Yad left town. Is why I left town. Yeah. yeah. Since I left town, it's gone up. <laughs> um, Palo Alto is number three. So California really representing yeah. the top yeah. here. Then Cambridge, of course. Mm -hmm. Bethesda, Maryland. Yeah. Ann Arbor, Newton, yeah. Ames, yeah. Iowa, Blooming, Indiana. Berkeley, California, Thanks, number 10. We have three of the top 10. That's pretty so, cool. But I was right. I was right. We're top in California, but there is another American city. Yeah. That 13, well. Mountain View. Mm. What, is that just because they're all, oh, it's because of the Googleplex and the Silicon Valley. Belt. Totally. Uh, Irvine knows <laughs> is that, is or Mountain Cupertino, View is in that Cupertino, number 18. What? <laughs> That's oh, where all biotech. the lawyers biotech. Live. No, that's yeah. where biotech is. Duh. <laughs> I'm just like Bay Area. Where's Goleta, California? That's number Goleta? 22. Yeah. 
I couldn't place it on a map, but I know oh, I've been there. The proximity to UC Santa Barbara. That's why. Okay, there we are. Man, California has a lot on here. Pasadena's number 28. Walnut Creek, 30. Mm. Bay Area. Irvine, 32. Santa Cruz, 35. Damn. And again, no, they, these are, California. A lot of these, 39. a lot of these, like Santa Cruz. Friends, and it's, this it's is like town. it's a small university town. It's also this is why nice. California should secede. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't <laughs> That's what I, this is why California doesn't relate to anywhere else. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, for real. Everybody's like, why is California so weird? Yeah. So this and this Sunnyvale, is actually number 41. This, this is a is lot. Actually, a really dip, a thing that I'm always using, uh, having to make a distinguishing remark when, uh, I mean, it's almost a, a trope here that, we, you know, uh, when people are from somewhere, where are you from? People will say France. I am from Germany. I am from Spain. And Americans will say, I'm from California. Mm -hmm. I'm from Illinois. Yeah. I'm, I, we'll say the state because we don't want to be associated with wherever. But I say I'm know, from so, Canada. Uh <laughs> Yana came to me. She had this uh, statistics on uh, this horrible statistics of uh, what is it? Rates of uh, maternity deaths. Uh, United States is like up in 20 per 100,000 or whatever it is. It's like it's one of the worst countries to survive having a baby. It's like so bad. And I went and did a drill down on it because I felt like that doesn't sound right. Uh, California is basically up near the top with mm -hmm. the Sweden sure. and Denmark and the rest it's of the It's abortion you know, rights, man. It's only going to get with, worse. And I'm like, yeah, it's it's you have to understand we don't have universal health care in the United States. Yeah. So what you have is disparate little fiefdoms inventing it for the like it's the like it yeah. out a whole cloth. So Sex education's not allowed. Like it just you have it's a patchwork a of things. Yeah. So when you look at California is right there with a, a you know, modern uh, European city, whatever, uh, or country. It's, it's about their, their other countries are about the size of cities. It's easy to just, um, but, but California is like, it is completely different from the rest of the United States in so many ways. And I think a big part of it is what you're pointing out. When you have the highest per capita of PhD students, you know, and so in all many of these cities, yeah, yeah. these people, you know, we, we, there's also you could say there's a level of then ability to have the finances to look past your own nose in terms of what's important for your community and your survival and, and things like this. We've talked before about how the stress of of not paying attention to anything going on around you when you have uh, serious financial constraints is a survival strategy that you need to do yeah uh, but having a combination of affluent and educated together because you can have a fluent uh, affluent and not educated and uh, you end up with florida um <laughs> and and arizona you can have pockets of affluence with lack of education and you end up with thing that is indistinguishable from a pack of wild baboons or you have the combination of education and affluence that then can look beyond just the immediate and start to do things like, my goodness, uh, Newsom announced that he wants to have California, the state of California, start manufacturing insulin. Uh, we can't get the drug companies to cap the price or to give us a reasonable price You could price do that through and, the state. And the huh. state says, we're just going to look into putting a bunch of money into building facilities to manufacture insulin for cost uh, for the, you know, our, our own. Health. California is basically getting into a one payer healthcare system as it is. So controlling some of the pharma, why not? Makes perfect sense. I'm really a fan of the whole like Cascadia idea that you know like california and oregon or at least western oregon and washington could kind of and then just boise um would, <laughs> would have been all kind of joined together as one little consortium we could share our health care and our educational systems i have a dream <laughs> i love it 
the dream of Cascadia. Yeah. Instead, we got to try to bring everybody dragging them behind us. Like, come on. Lift everyone up. We can do yeah, it. Some, some things we can California's be, definitely we can done that. Be the strong, uh, strong men. With the uh, with vehicle emissions, of course, California yeah. said we're going to restrict the amount of emissions that can come out of a tailpipe, and thirteen other states just basically, whenever we come up with one of these uh, air air standards, they just check off on it and copy it. It saves them the whole thing of having an air resources California board, versus and it's Texas. a good idea. Yeah, right. Well, the auto manufacturers looked at it and said, "Okay, California is the biggest market." Yeah. For cars uh, in the United States. And they've picked up enough other little takers on instead of making because for a while they tried to make cars to the California standard and like, you know, slap a thing that a cardboard muffler on the back of the other ones. And it's actually ended up being more expensive to build two different ways and cheaper to streamline everything just to make it to the California air standard. So that's what they did. Our in laws state is going to provide entertainment. Awesome. <laughs> I'm just going to cry. I'm going to cry about that guy, our in law What? What is it? What was the thing? Dr. Oz and thing. Yes. I'm um, going to just cry. About? Politics and the big circus it is. But, oh, um, oh, oh, I see now. Okay. Uh, dude that Oprah put on TV is running for senator here. Yeah. Oh, that guy but from New Jersey. New Jersey, who doesn't live in New Jersey. In who no, he bought a in house that he's not living in. And no, he lives in New things. Jersey. He's, he's running in Pennsylvania. Right, but he bought a house in Pennsylvania so that he could be, have residency, no, just, but he doesn't just, live there. He didn't even buy a house. He's using he his mother-in-law's <laughs> mailing address. He didn't even buy a house. He didn't even, like... No, he's just no. He didn't even go. He that did. He far. bought a house. That was the recent he news. He bought. A, he bought like oh, okay. some three million dollar place or something like that, and is getting That's some kind of tax kickback for it because it. He's not cutting down trees on the land, yeah, and then nice. he's yeah, but he's getting residency for it. But he doesn't live there anyway. But Aaron Lynn, Aaron Laura says nope. He didn't buy it. Okay, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Doctor, oh, that is not I, what we want to talk uh, about. Oh, <laughs> Blair is our fact checker this evening. <laughs> fact checking, it's good. Okay, Iron Lore says it's in his mother in law's mother in law's name. Mother in law, and yes, because you can't get the tax break if you're not a resident of the state. <laughs> Oh, he misspelled his name of his Pennsylvania address on some of his uh, forms running for office. <laughs> oh, because he's never been there. Yeah. He misspelled the town's name. Yeah, That's of course. the worst part. No. I'm from Unless he small town spell Murbury. Murbury, I think it's called. What is that small town called? I don't even know what small uh, town I'm from. But I'm so Wait, in touch small. with small towns. Uh, and oh, he I is going to shoot his in-laws. Gun. Place. That is, is that what's happening. Wrong end, or I'll turn it around. <laughs> He's renting his in-laws' house. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good, 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 good. What a joke that guy is. It oh, is providing boy. entertainment. Well, Thank yeah. you. It's, can, I'm <laughs> I'm all good with the reality stars and politics. Like, how did that come into politics before science? <laughs> Just like, no scientists in our politics. But you know what? Reality TV stars. Let's do it. It's because we didn't get the scientists to be oh. the celebrities early enough. And mm -hmm. the celebrities became the they big They were thing. once upon a time. But yeah. You know, uh, I just found out that the uh, that uh, conspiracy radio podcast YouTuber guy was yes. making like some crazy like $800,000 a month or more or something on that. I think we should take this show in a new direction. Is it time for conspiracy? I, I, because I'm pretty nope. sure. No, well, like I was saying, you were gone at the time. I think we need to do sciences. Yeah. 
We wow. will call on the spirits of dead scientists to come and speak with us, with our seances. <laughs> I'm sure I have a Ouija board folded up somewhere in my games pile somewhere. We can get them to say some things like science. $800,000 a day. It pays to lie. Or, you know. But I just didn't think it paid that well. Otherwise, I'd have done it a long time ago. <laughs> People like, really, 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 really like to be lied to. <laughs> Fact-based, science-y stuff. Uh, like, we could just replace the, my part of the first half of this show with just a sound mm. effect. You know, wah, wah, wah. Like, oh, here's bad news. Hey, forget the bad news. Guess what? Non-stick cooking where uh, makes you healthier. It's a big conspiracy to get rid of PFAS. I mean, it's good for the environment. It's just whatever. Like if they're going to pay yeah. us that much, let's sell out. Can we? Is it too late? We don't yell enough and we don't, we're not. I ang- could. I'm, Have you <laughs> seen the paycheck? We I don't yell. yell enough? I know, really? I think that's what it is. I don't know. I'm like, we're not sensational enough. We're loud. Uh, uh, we're not angry at people. We don't call people names. I don't. I don't know. Yes, in this seance, know. we're bringing back the the spirit of Harry Science. Houdini to talk about <laughs> his his work in anti spiritualism yeah. and uh, debunking seances. What do you have to say for yourself, Harry? Oh boy, was I wrong. Also, that uh, last <laughs> trick of mine, I probably shouldn't have tried it. Maybe that wasn't the best idea. He didn't try it. Somebody came and sucker punched him. Yeah, he died on stage from an appendix eruption. Poor guy. Yeah. From an, an appendix eruption? Yeah. I think it was What'd an appendix. Say? Yeah, so he had this part of his act where he could he would tighten his muscles and take a really strong punch. Yeah. And then yeah. Uh, somebody like punched him in the stomach when he wasn't ready yeah, he for wasn't it, ready. not part of the act. They sucker And he him, like yeah. ruptured his kidney or ah. something and and like internal bleeding didn't really like go to you know have modern medicine then to begin mm-hmm. with appendix spleen something like well you don't want ruptured well pretty much that goes for everything on the inside you don't want sepsis ruptured. you know <laughs> but uh but it was really rupturing he bad collapsed on stage and died uh, shortly after but he was he was in fevered and still doing the show for a while it's, uh, we don't know if must going go to a doctor on. back then would have saved him, but it might have. Yeah. So go to the doctor if you don't feel good. Could yeah, have saved Henson? <laughs> he decided to work through a flu and died. Uh, pneumonia. He had, what is it called? The he ended up pneumonia. With, he ended up with walking it's pneumonia. But not a big he, deal. It's he had not a big he had, deal at no, all. But he had, but you, he had if it. you go to the doctor, it's easy to treat. If you yes, go to the doctor. So, so he had yes. a really bad flu, but he worked through it. And then yeah. collapsed. And by the time he got to the hospital, it was too late. <sighs> wow. So go to the doctor if you don't feel good, please. Okay. That's all I'm saying. Sound well, but uh, <laughs> but but consult the consult your doctor first before you take any of our medical advice. Consult the doctor. I'm telling you that. to consult a doctor. No, no, no. You're saying go to the doctor. You should consult the call you, the nurse first. Come on, that's a colloquialism. You know what I mean. You try to stir up stuff. He's always trying to stir up stuff. Trying to give up that free medical advice. Where's your credentials for that? You can't do that. Telling people to go to a doctor if they feel <laughs> if sick. They You're feel not a sick. doctor. You don't know how they're doing. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> um, this is how we're going to make the big bucks. See, and, and this is also <laughs> fine if you want to talk in absolutes here. Men are bad at going to the doctor. <laughs> that actually is science. Is so that are Christian scientists. Men don't like to go to the doctor when they don't feel good. And I, I have a theory that the reason that women don't mind is because we have to get poked and prodded so often anyway. It's like, yeah, whatever. I'll go to the doctor. <laughs> it's also why women have more heart attacks or die from heart attacks more often is because they're more used to pain. And so mm. they don't go to the doctor when they do have pains. <laughs> I believe that also. Okay. Oh, my well, God. That's just I would, I would... a funny thing. It's all right. I would also suggest perhaps just based on the human male friends that I've had throughout my life, 
A lot of men probably avoid going to the doctor when they've gotten their body into trouble because they intentionally did the thing that caused the problem. <laughs> well, so also a lot of the time like, I think they there. think they <laughs> can fix it. They're like, oh, I don't want to go to the doctor now because I'm, I'm gonna. They're gonna tell me I have bad cholesterol, but I'm gonna I'm gonna fix it. I'm gonna shape up. I'll go to the doctor and then, then I'll go when I yeah. lose a little weight, so I don't get bad news. <laughs> it's like brushing your teeth no. right before you go to the dentist. Don't do that. Just go be honest. Okay. Th this is how my teeth usually look. I just wanted yeah. you to see it. I just Tell came me. here right after eating broccoli just okay. for you. Actually, yeah. I need to see, I can't see your teeth, which is why you're here. So it would be actually helpful if you brush them. First. It's your teeth that I'm trying to look at that are now covered in this broccoli and potato something, I'm assuming. Oh, yum. Yum, yum, yum. Hey, we, maybe we could come up with some conspiracy theories. Like, what if we create a conspiracy theory that, like, the oil companies had gotten together and, and plotted to keep people yeah. from knowing the truth about global warming and the deteriorous effects that it would have on them so they could keep making money for a longer period uh -huh. of time? Or what about the thing with light bulbs, how light bulbs were intentionally made to not last as long so they could sell more light bulbs? And, and like, how about... <laughs> what other what other conspiracy theories? How about the fact Ooh. that anti-abortion laws are really there to prevent poor people from getting abortions, but rich people will continue to get abortions? How about that conspiracy theory? <sighs> and how about the conspiracy theory conspiracy. that they don't actually care about abortions except they fundraise so well yeah. off of it and get, that that's really the reason that they're yeah. even pretending to care about an issue because they obviously don't when it comes to caring for foster kids or mothers or daycare or health care for mothers or any of the rest of it. So it's really just a political None issue. None of these issues are really money. issues to them. It's just money raising. It's it's politics. Politics. How do we do that and avoid politics? Women out of the workforce also. Wait, wait, you guys, you guys, you guys, stop, stop. We're starting to talk about real world issues. We need to talk about, <laughs> we need to talk about really how evolution <laughs> is, is an egg-based conspiracy and how eggs are just trying to take over the world by continuing the manufacturing of eggs and that evolution and all the different life forms that we see is just an in-between from getting one egg from getting from one egg to the next. And that it's all about the eggs from the eggs perspective and that the rest of the world doesn't matter. But then who are we really who gets no, but I mean, actually the grand conspiracy we, is that we're we're the city bus for the microbiome. None of it matters. Ooh, yeah. City bus. Yeah. Ooh, alien mind control. The Planet aliens human. are our microbes. Uh-huh. And we're the spaceships. This is fun, but that's not whose know. ideas are these anyway? Yeah. It's the microbes. They're telling us what to think. Oh, oh, but then I realized how he made money too is by selling products. Oh, so we right? don't do that. do that a little bit on our Zazzle store, but no, but they sell like, uh, oh, if you're worried about global warming, then what you need to do is you need shorts. Shorts is the thing that everybody's going to wear. If you don't have shorts, there's going to be a run on shorts. You can buy shorts. You can buy shorts. We got, we got shorts. They come in a plastic Blair, We should put shorts on the twist Zazzle store. Okay. <laughs> Do they have shorts? No, it's because you're, you're too I know small. I've got towels Sur for those gotta call warm them days global at the beach. Global warming survival <laughs> kit. We got to sell a global warming survival kit. It'll come with shorts, pH 250 sunscreen. And, and one of your, those little battery powered fans water that filter. spritzes water at you. No shorts on Zazzle. <laughs> Dr. Justin's not a real Dr. Poop Pills. That's got to be the first thing on the list. We got to push the product. We don't push the product like they push it on the other shows. And I that's can't. I can't. I partly can't. because we don't really have product. We have some merch. Fan we'll merch is cool, product. but it's not product. We need we just to just want to talk about science. Ooh, they have pajama pants on Zazzle. Ooh. I hope they're telling you, folks. Ones. I'm telling you, folks. When the when the New World Order Global Warming uh, Illuminati takeover. They're going to get rid of pajamas. You need to get your pajamas now. You need to get your pajamas. pajamas. They're not going to get rid of pajamas. They're going to get rid of sleep entirely. They're, you're not going to need to sleep. They're going to put stuff in the air that's going to keep you awake all the time. And you won't need to sleep, so you won't need pajamas. But you should get your pajamas right now. Get your pajamas. And then you where can hide from get them. Branded? Where do hey, where did that adult uh, dating site go back? Did they pay for sponsorship? Did we get them back on the... <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
best adult science show. But we're gonna have internet. like we'll have like the worst product placement. Ladies and gentlemen, are are you unsatisfied with your current accuracy in pipetting? Why? <laughs> There's a new <laughs> pipette. Stability <laughs> tool. Oh, this was a pipetting for pipetting proper pipetting calibration. The only name you should trust is the good folks at Calibrite. Why the Calibrite folks will calibrate your pipetting needs. Oh, what if you yeah, had gonna be a pipette with forceps attached? You know, I think there's spider forceps. I think there might be a market for uh, research and medical goods, but I don't know that our audience really needs that because we're at that. We're not, we're, our audience isn't, oh, hey, they're back. Oh, they came back. Oh, thank you. I got oh, it. I'm back. blocking. Oh, but wait, <laughs> but maybe they, maybe they they're trying have... to prove it. You're right. <laughs> but it proves they are listeners to the show. So I will say I do appreciate them for that. <laughs> Because <laughs> they paid attention. Like, all right, I won't okay, promote I'll, my adult I'm back and get blocked oh, again. Justin has now asked in the after show. Okay, he's got, got permission now. Folks, I don't often do adult dating, especially now that I'm married. But when I do, the only adult dating site that I go to is the one that is guaranteed to be best. Well, you don't want to go for second best when you're adult dating. I oh, know you don't want second rate adult dating. What you want is, is the best adult dating. Oh, yeah, I don't think he must be a crazy person because I don't think I can. I don't think I would really. I don't think I could. I, could, I couldn't yes. keep a straight face. I couldn't. And, and the products, too. I'm like, have nope. you have you noticed that your your current quality of toast isn't what you'd really like it to be? Ah, before you before you go blaming your toaster. Maybe it's the wrong bread that you're using to make your toast. I would suggest that you go to good old, what is it? What's the big San Francisco sourdough company? Is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're talking Boudin. about Boudin. Sure. Because that's a, that's a bakery. Quality, quality toastable bread. Uh, not like the other breads. They just turned into crusty crap when you pull it. <laughs> I don't even know how to do an ad. <laughs> for a your product. bread not tasting the way you like it when it's nicely buttered. Mm -hmm. Bread you want your good. buttered bread, this bread to good. treat you better? <laughs> Get our microbe this... butter. Uh, it's butter uh, treated with microbes. It has nano flavors. <laughs> nano small, flavors. small things that make the flavor better. <laughs> New quantum nano butter. The sciencey butter for all your sciencey <laughs> butter needs. I started using plant butter, which is quite good. <laughs> That's that's just but are they that's a just sponsor? plant fat? Yeah, it's like, like margarine basically, but there's like slightly less hydrocarbons in it. What would be really fun would be to no, have it's margarine like, rebranded. Yeah, for sure it <laughs> is. Have... Although it cooks nicer, it cooks a lot nicer than margarine. I do think it's a little bit different because I can like fry things on the pan with it in a way that margarine doesn't work. I'm like. afraid for you. I am afraid for what you about uh, about the chemicals? Plant butter. No, I I, I looked at make, the chemical list. Make a better. It's like plant basically butter. just olive oil. You know, when I need a a cool, refreshing <laughs> drink, Here, I'm gonna look something it up. that's rehydrating that uh, really yeah. gets me back and go. Oh, and he going freezes. on meeting the days. Tap water. Why <laughs> tap water? It's what it's good for you. <laughs> You brought Brian, to you by it. municipalities everywhere. Brian Burwell, whatever happened to the lowered expectations dating service that was always promoted on Mad TV? I love that one. <laughs> lowered expectations. <laughs> and somebody like reaching for a fence, but it's like pop wires. That's what you really do need. That's yeah, a dating site precious. that helps you lower your expectations. Oh yes. no. Oh, yes. I have the yawns there. also. And it's I have to get up and go on a junk run tomorrow morning to the mm. dump. Woohoo. I have the job. I have a job cleaning up tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! I get to throw things away. There's nothing like moving to make you feel like a really bad person when it comes to like 
your impact on the planet. <laughs> like you get to that point where you're like, I can't recycle anymore. I'm so done. I'm so tired. Everything goes in the garbage. <laughs> it's all gone. It happens, I'm man. A bad person. No. Bad Not person. what you are, but a lot of your recycling <laughs> goes in the garbage anyway. Look, look, oh, it's, it's, it's global the recycling conspiracy. All that stuff just ends up in the ocean anyway. All the uh, plastics just end up in the ocean. Yeah. And very little of it actually gets recycled. Oh, see, we can do it. We can totally do this conspiracy uh, type uh, version of the show. Hey, but until we figure out all the details of that, and out, and, and what, we'll just always remember that Gwen Stefani used to go, used to have a bad day in our chat room. It's true. <laughs> the fake, <laughs> fake Gwen Stefani. The real Gwen Stefani was probably at a Whole Foods with my with my dad picking out. She, yeah, uh, picking out bananas. Butter. Oh, okay. B a n a n a s. B a n a n a s. Good night, Blair. Say good morning, Justin. Morning, Justin. Good, good night, night Kiki. Kiki. Good night, everyone. Thank you for not going to bed while we ranted and raved and conspiracy scienced. And we do hope that you'll join us again next week, back Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay curious.